my neighbors and I moved in at the same time. Same month, same week, same street. We lived across from one another in identical, mirrored houses. I didn't know a lot about them, but I'd seen them move around their property a couple of times. They were already a family, having two kids just about to enter their teens, while June and I were still expecting our first. Their mailbox revealed their name to be the Watersons. We thought it'd be nice to live in a neighborhood with other families, and to be honest, we didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. My company transfer had been sudden, and it was either quit or move. Since I couldn't afford to be out of work those first months of parenthood, June and I decided it'd be best to follow along. Besides, we both had relatives not too far from the area. The move itself was rather painless, and we got June's work-from-home office set up in a matter of days. I barely even got a weekend to settle before I had to be in on the following Monday. Being a manager for a small packaging plant might not sound like a lot, but considering the scale of specialized orders we were receiving at that time, I figured it would take at least three guys to replace me at the helm. All in all, we were busy. All of us. But at the end of that first month, the Watersons did something strange. They started shooting fireworks. At first it was a fun surprise. June's favorite holiday is Independence Day, so she has this fascination with anything bright and shiny in the sky. So when the Watersons started popping off white sky flowers and cascading shades of cyan, June just dropped her jaw and cheered. Those first few weeks, we got the sense that, one way or another, things were just going to work out. We had a moment on that, albeit cramped patio, enjoying the night sky together. Then life just went on as it should for a while. The orders at work slowed to a normal pace. June kept her appointments with her obstetrician, and life kept grinding forward. Slowly, the boxes were unpacked, and little post-it notes were put up on the fridge. Painting started to get crooked, and the hallway rug inched ever and ever further towards the front door. Baby stuff littered the hallways, anticipating our bundle of love's arrival. After about a month at the new house, I remember having a late dinner with June. I'd had a long day with a bit of unpaid overtime, and she'd been kind enough to keep it all warm for me. As soon as we sat down to eat, there was a flash outside, followed by a thundering boom. We realized that, once again, the Watersons were shooting fireworks. Apparently this was a monthly thing. That might be a problem. Our baby girl Janine was born on September 29th. June was a goddamn superhero through it all. I was there for it, even though June insisted that she was fine. Hell, she even asked me to put in an extra shift to keep myself busy. Of course I didn't, but that gives you an idea of just how pragmatic this blessing of a woman really is. We brought Janine home and got into a new routine. Parents to a newborn are rarely the most cheerful of people, and I can't pretend it was all sunshine and roses. But we managed pretty well, all things considering. While a shock at first, our new life came creeping up on us in a way we could have never prepared for. But through it all, Janine was the sweetest thing. Probably the least fussy baby I've ever met. All smiles and kisses. The only thing she didn't like was loud noises, which we realized one morning when a sleep-deprived June dropped a box of cutlery across the kitchen floor. It took us a solid half hour just to calm the girl down. Then there were the Watersons. Fucking Watersons. It's like they were just waiting for us to need peace and quiet before they showed their true colors. It started an ordinary Sunday about 1 a.m. I woke from the flash before I even heard the bang. This massive rocket popping off right over our house, bathing the entire street in an eerie blue light. It was loud enough to rattle the window, sending Janine into a panicked cry. I sat with her most of the night, telling her everything was going to be okay, while June desperately tried to catch a few hours of half-sleep. Janine was terrified, and she was vocal about letting me know so. I remember sitting by the kitchen window, bottle-feeding her, staring daggers at the Waterfords across the street. I could see the father of the family out on the front lawn, looking up as if considering if he ought to fire another. Thankfully, he didn't. Not that night, at least. Fireworks kept going off in the middle of the night about once every three days after that. 
I tried going over to talk to them, but none of them seemed to be around during the day, not even the kids. I remember waiting by the door for their car to pull up in the driveway to confront them, but I seemed to have chronically bad timing. Then, one night, they blasted off again. This time, June was handling Janine, and I went straight for the door. I was out in a t-shirt and my tidy whitey slipping on a pair of sneakers halfway out the door. That was the first time I got a good look at Irvin Watterson, the head of the family. The man was in his mid-fifties, was about six foot five, and had a shiny bald head. His eyes were sunken and tired, and he had this kind of slouching face, like an old dog. He had a sort of pallor to his skin, like an old ham. I didn't care, though. What the fuck are you doing? I yelled. What the fuck is wrong with you? He just looked at me like he didn't understand what the hell kind of language I was speaking. When I pointed at him, he visibly recoiled. Don't you fucking walk away, I demanded. Not one more fucking time or I'm calling the police. He gave me this look, like a frightened animal. And as I stepped closer, he burst into a sprint, heading straight for the door. Before I even got halfway across the street, I could hear bolts and chains dragged across the inside of his front door. I got up to it and pounded on it. I screamed at him, demanding an answer. And yet, nothing. Not a word. Not a sound. I'd cooled off in the morning, but June hadn't. She called not only the police, but the HOA. I urged her on, but we soon realized it was an exercise in futility. Not only was there no rule about fireworks in the local bylaws, but it was a point of pride just how open the neighborhood rule set was. If anything, we suspected that this might have been the reason the Watersons moved there in the first place. Hell, even the police gave us the cold shoulder, saying it wouldn't be worth their time to come knocking when there was nothing to enforce. It started to make sense how we got that place so cheap. It wasn't really meant for families, it seemed. We'd just been tricked by seeing what we thought were another normal family across the street. We tried to confront the Watersons a couple more times. June tried once, only to see their young boys scurry back inside the house. I tried to knock on the door again, but didn't get any kind of response. It's like they were scared of us. But not like a normal kind of scared. An almost animal-like kind of scared. How these people could drive a car was a mystery. But the fireworks continued. A few days might pass, but they would always come back. Janine did not want to get used to it, and I couldn't blame her. Not only was it startling, but it felt sinister. Like there was a genuine ill will behind it. Something meant to harm. I always got the sense that there was a reverence to it from the Watersons. I could see them bending down on one knee gently to place the rocket, like a Tibetan monk lighting incense. There was a ceremony to it. I got a better look at the rest of the Watersons, too. Aileen Watterson, the mother, didn't seem a day over 30, but she looked like she'd never cut her hair once in her life. It almost dragged across the ground, tapping against her heels as she walked. She had the same kind of sickly pallor as her husband, and the same sunken eyes. I never saw her blink, not even once. Their kids could have been twins, if not for one being slightly taller than the other. Same physique, same sickly pallor, and the same drooping faces as their father. The closest description I can manage is that they were, in a sense, ghoulish. About a week passed, and the fireworks just seemed to grow more intense. I remember getting Janine her bottle in the kitchen when I noticed June sneaking by the window, looking at something across the street. I checked it out, spotting Aileen out and about in their front garden. June just shook her head, whispering, who the hell plants things mid-October? The Watersons, it seems. I sighed. Probably getting their kid a new set of drums, too. You shut that cursed mouth. They might hear you. But of course, they didn't. If anything, Aileen wouldn't have noticed the entire world collapsing around her. If anything, she seemed to be perfectly at peace with her hands deep in the soil, picking out rocks and roots and planting something deep below. Then it stopped. Several days passed and there were no fireworks. We thought it was finally over. But apparently they'd just gotten started. I remember the turning point. 
I was up with Janine when I saw the whole Watterson clan sneak out the front door. They all stopped to look at their little garden, and one by one they started to do this weird howling noise. Sort of a screech, like the mix of a wounded pig and a panting dog. All of them in unison, cackling. Janine didn't even cry, she just looked out the window, just as confused as I was. I saw Irvin pulling up handfuls of grass from his front yard, throwing it in the air in celebration. The boys were dancing around the car, hand in hand. Aileen was just on her knees, openly weeping. I thought about filming it, but Janine had already fallen back asleep, and I didn't want to risk waking her. It was such a bizarre sight, and I couldn't even see what the fuss was about. The next morning, as they scurried back inside, June and I went out to see what they were cheering about. Looking at their front garden, there was no obvious response. All I saw were some kind of sprouting seeds. They had these large, oval-shaped leaves with just a hint of blue to them. June stepped right up on their front yard to take a closer look. I didn't have the time to protest, as I was carrying Janine, who decided that my beard was her new favorite plaything. Looks like sunflowers, said June. My mom grew these once. Sunflowers? Yeah, June nodded. Pretty sure. There was nothing more to it. A bunch of pale sunflowers, and that was all it took to send this family into a frenzy. It started to dawn on us that there was something deeply wrong here. Maybe even dangerous. June gave the authorities another shot the next day. She tried calling CPS, but she couldn't make a good enough argument for someone to check in on the boys. They were already registered as homeschooled, and there was nothing inherently wrong with cheering in the front yard or shooting fireworks. June almost cried in frustration, having been bounced between one number to the next for over 40 minutes. Only to be told there was nothing they could do. At that point, we had no idea what to do. We were genuinely worried about the Watersons, and it seemed like no one shared that feeling. I talked to a few people at work about it, but none of them had anything to say. And why would they? They'd never even seen the Watersons, let alone lived across the street from them. But the most telling cue was Janine. She had gone from quiet and cuddly to fearful and anxious, seemingly overnight. It got to the point where we had to go to the doctor to make sure it wasn't something physically wrong, but of course there wasn't. It was only a matter of regular rest and food, it seemed which wasn't as simple as it sounded thanks to the Watersons. For the next few nights, we were anxious. The Watersons had been eerily quiet, and that couldn't be a good thing. It was now sort of understood that whoever was up with Janine had a responsibility to check the front yard every now and then to see if there was something we could pin on the Watersons to have them investigated. It was petty, sure, but these people had been a menace. We couldn't have Janine suffer because those bastards refused to act like people. It all came down to this one night in early November. I was sitting up with Janine, watching their front yard from the kitchen window, when I spotted Irvin and the oldest kid stockpiling something in the yard. It looked like dark little boxes, but I couldn't tell what they contained. They filled a big space in the yard with them, approximately 8 by 8 feet, spacing the boxes out evenly. They were at it for a long time, until Irvin stepped up to the living room window. He slapped his hand across the surface, slowly rubbing it back and forth. Seconds later, his wife and youngest son joined him outside. It was so uncanny, like even their knocks were strange. I brought out my phone and started recording, just in case. They were doing something to the boxes, but I couldn't tell what. After a while, they all stepped back, all but Irvin, who held up a lighter. Only then did I realize they were setting up the biggest batch of fireworks I'd ever seen. By the time I got to June, they'd already lit the fuse. Given how loud their display had been earlier nights, this was going to be on a whole other level. I set Janine down and covered her ears as I yelled at June to do the same. She was barely awake, but did as I asked without question. I tried to hunch my shoulders over my ears, but I couldn't quite make it. Janine was already crying, sensing the tension in the air. Moments later, there was this barrage of thumps as rocket after rocket leapt into the sky at least two dozen. They sailed up, but nothing happened. For a brief moment, I almost thought my prayers had been answered. Then the sky exploded. For a moment, night turned to day. I could see every inch of the bedroom as the light burned into my eyes, 
every contour of my wife and child, the pile of used clothes in the corner, the diapers at the changing station. Then came the sound. It was so loud that I felt it before I heard it. The windows rattled and I saw a painting fall. By the time it hit the floor, there was a sound so deafening I didn't hear the frame shatter. It immediately made my head ring. I could see June screaming something, but I couldn't hear her. I had the screeching noise piercing all the way from my ear to my throat. Janine was okay, albeit a bit upset about the whole thing, but she was fine. I'd covered her in time. June put two fingers up to her ear and mouth as if signaling she was going to call someone. Then she picked up Janine. I was dizzy, trying my best to just stand straight. Without that inner ear balance, your head feels like it's on a swivel. I lost my footing three times just heading towards the hallway. All I could hear was this incessant screeching coming from the back of my head, like there were two frayed cables in my mind rubbing against one another, sending sparks down my spine. It was still bright outside, where I could see vague shapes of the Watersons dancing in their front yard. There was a fresh crack in our bedroom window, casting a strange shadow on my face. Trickles of water had started to silently tap against the pavement outside, forming puddles in the potholes. As I got to the window, I could feel myself calling out to June, but I couldn't hear it. It was just this deep rumble in my chest. I became hyper-aware of my own breathing and pulse, the only noise is able to reach my head. It dawned on me that this could in fact be permanent. I was surprised to see June holding up a finger against her lips, as if asking me to be silent. Then she pointed at the door. There was someone outside. A dark shadow against the sudden backdrop of a downpour. For a moment we just stood there. June held Janine tight to her chest, looking back and forth between me and the door. I turned my head towards the kitchen, my eyes landing on the knife block. June was nodding at me, silently asking me to be prepared. There was no telling what these people were capable of, and we wouldn't want to risk it. I couldn't hear shit, but June could call for help. I saw her yelling something as the door shook. A threat, perhaps. I felt the vibrations of sound bounce against the side of my head, unable to reach through the thicket of my ears. I hurried into the kitchen and grabbed a knife as my mind raced. He might be saying he had a weapon or that he was going to hurt us. There was no way to know. The rain was coming down hard, obfuscating the silhouette outside. But as the door shook again, I could tell that whatever was happening was violent. I placed myself between June and the front door, urging her to back away. She hurried into the bedroom, holding up her phone to me. I nodded. She stopped at the bedroom door, waving at me to follow. I intended to. Then the front door came down. Irvin Watterson pushed his way through the crumbling door frame, reaching for me. His sickly features lit up in a smile. My first instinct was to look back at June to make sure she'd locked herself in. She did, reluctantly. Then it was just me and the lanky man. He had no weapons, just these arms that seemed to go on forever. He was so much taller and had so much longer reach than I'd anticipated. Not only was my hearing throwing me off, but there was something just inherently wrong about him. His left hand grabbed me by the bicep, pulling me towards him. There was this thick, sticky coat of something warm in the palm of his hand, searing my arm like a sort of glue. I tried slicing him, but it was like trying to cut rubber. He dragged me out into the rain, ecstatic. I could see him convulsing in a laugh. I kept trying to stab him, but I lost my footing. He didn't skip a beat, he just kept dragging me backwards into the middle of the street. I looked around, trying to scream for help. I could feel the air leaving my lungs, but nothing happened. The other Watersons were standing in their driveway, looking up into the rain. Behind them, I could see that the sunflower seed had already sprouted, turning a sickly shade of blue. Irvin looked down on me, saying something, and nodded. I shook my head, and he nodded again, more intensely this time. He was telling me something he was going to do. Something that was going to happen. And looking at the way his hand had fused to my skin, I didn't know what to think. It was just this freezing panic settling into my spine. Only then did I realize it was still bright outside. The fireworks had long since stopped. It is hard to explain the sensation. 
I looked up and felt this immediate drain. Like going from well-rested to sleep-deprived in the span of a breath. There was this swirling light, something intensely red. Something that had seen the Watersons and answered their call. Something that wanted to get a better look at us. Like an eye in the sky. It was so fast. The rain turned from a downpour into an opposite uppour, sucking whatever had been dropped back up. I could see the other Watersons rise from the ground just a few feet at first, then all the way up the side of the house and into the bright contrast of the mysterious light above. It was this painless, effortless glide like a feather across a river. Into the sky. First I thought Irvin was growing taller, until I realized what was happening. He was going away too, and he was bringing me with him. In a heartbeat, I was three feet into the air, hanging by his hand. He wasn't letting go. No amount of cutting or stabbing would make him stop. Soon, my feet dangled in the air, my toes no longer reaching the ground, as I looked up at the ecstatic grin of Irvin Watterson. Unblinking. Relentless. Overjoyed. There was only one option left as I shoved the kitchen knife into my own skin, cutting myself loose. I collapsed onto the ground, spraining my ankle in the process. The rain, still getting sucked back up, trickled over my body, bringing along swaths of blood that danced its way up my face. Looking up, I caught one final glimpse of Irvin Watterson, his hand outstretched, his face devastated by what can only be described as guilt. He waved his fingers at me, urging me to reach for him. It's like he didn't understand why I was fighting him, like he was doing me a favor, saving me. But as his face disappeared further and further away, and the ground went dry, I was left on the pavement with a bleeding arm. Thank God June had already called the police. That night left me with a nasty case of tinnitus, and a hand-shaped scar on my bicep. But considering what could have happened, I consider myself lucky. Janine has just started middle school, and no one has seen the Watersons since that night. Their house was bought up by some sort of industrial machining company to use the land. We were bought out too, and moved after just a year of living there. None of us really minded. We'd gotten so paranoid that getting away was a blessing. Even though we'd lost a fair amount of money on the deal. Sometimes late at night, especially when it rains, I look up at the clouds. I can almost feel that grin looking back at me that there was something malevolent looking down, waiting for something bright enough to guide its path. And sometimes, in the distance, I see it. A red eye in the clouds, dreaming across the night sky. Hurry up and get to class, young man. The bell rang ten minutes ago. Sam, the janitor, waved at me as I went by. He was always looking out for us kids, even if we were breaking the rules. He shot me a wink and went back to mopping the floor near the water fountain. Attending school at the academy was a privilege. And what mattered most was your aptitude. And I had the aptitude. There was no doubt about that. I was the top of all my classes, the envy of all my peers... I guess that's why I could get away with sauntering into class ten minutes late. The heavy oak door swung open with a loud creak, and everyone in class turned to look at me, as the professor was interrupted mid-sentence. So now the most important thing, class, and now this is vital. The teacher paused, staring daggers at me, and refused to continue what he was saying. I made my way to my desk and sat down, feeling the eyes of everyone on the back of my neck. You're late again, Mr. Jacobson, Professor Whitby said. And what is the reason this time? My excuses were legendary around these parts. Homicidal nano-robot attack? I offered with a straight face. There were a few muffled laughs and giggles. Homicidal nano-robot attack, the professor confirmed. 
lowering his glasses in disbelief. I nodded. Is that your final answer? He asked with a scowl. That was the first time I had seen him look genuinely angry. Mr. Jacobson, why don't you step up here to the front of the class and join me for just a moment? Ooh, the class intoned. Okay, I was starting to get a little bit nervous. The possibility of being expelled from the academy hadn't really occurred to me until just then. But the look on the professor's face suddenly reminded me that such things had happened before. And for much less than this. Standing up on shaky legs, I went to the front of the class. Mr. Jacobson, do you know what happens to young men who don't follow the rules of the academy? He put his hand on my shoulder, squeezing it just a little bit too firmly. No, sir. They get the collar. He brought his other hand up quickly and snapped a high-tech-looking collar around my neck. It had a blue glowing light at its center, which turned red once it was closed around my throat. My hands shot up instantly, trying to tear the thing from my neck. It was rigid and uncomfortable, and, and I wanted it off more than anything. The worst part was that it felt like it was sapping me of my energy as it blinked and thrummed abrasively against my skin. Suddenly, I had a feeling this was all wrong. It was like I was in a bad dream. Teachers at the academy didn't discipline students like this, did they? The rest of the class looked just as startled and terrified as me by what was happening. Come with me, young man. We're going to see the principal about your behavior. This school is too good for you. He began to march me out of the room, then down the hallway towards the principal's office. Sam, the kindly janitor, saw us and gasped. Mr. Locke, what are you doing? I tried to cry out for help, but the collar squeezed my throat so tightly it wouldn't allow it. The old janitor ran over with the mop in hand and swung the handle of it in a desperate attempt to stop the rogue teacher. But the younger man was quicker, and he dodged out of the way easily. Then he kicked the old man in the back, sending him flying into the lockers on the other side of the hall. Sam fell down to the floor, looking hurt. He was slow to get up as Mr. Locke grabbed me roughly by the arm again and began to drag me away down the hall. As I struggled and fought to get away, he pulled me past the principal's office and I realized he definitely wasn't taking me there. The front doors of the academy were just up ahead and he was taking me towards them, a determined look etched on his face. Come on, you little brat, quit fighting, he muttered under his breath as he dragged me down the hall my shoes dragging across the linoleum tiles. Someone stop him! He's kidnapping a student! Sam yelled from down the hall, getting his wind back. This prompted a security guard to come around the corner from his patrol. He pulled out his radio and spoke rapidly into the receiver. A few seconds later, the overhead PA came on, and a voice began to speak monotonously. Lockdown in effect. Lockdown in effect. All security personnel respond to the main entrance. Giant steel shutters began to close, blocking out the light from the front door and filling the hallway with darkness. Shit! Professor Locke looked worried all of a sudden. I need backup, he said, speaking into the cufflink of his shirt. They're going into lockdown. I've got the target 20 meters from the main entrance, looking for extraction. A few seconds later, there was a loud bang, and I looked to see the front door had been decimated by an explosion. After that... An APC crashed through the broken steel shutters which had covered the front entrance. Men in black body armor with high-tech weaponry emerged from the back of the vehicle and scrambled into defensive positions as Mr. Locke dragged me down the hall. What are you doing? Help me with this little brat. I got the collar on him. The men in body armor didn't move, but their weapons suddenly flew from their hands as if pulled by powerful electromagnets. The guns went past our heads and I looked back in surprise to see my entire class. All of the other students were in the hallway behind us. My classmates looked angry, their faces set with determined expressions, their hands stretched out in the air in front of them, and I felt Professor Locke's grip on my shoulder loosen. He was reaching up to his throat as if it was being squeezed by Darth Vader, choking him, just like his collar was choking me. No, stop. You must listen to me. I'm your teacher but the class didn't listen. The children began to raise their hands higher into the air, 
focusing their concentration on him, and Professor Locke's feet began to lift from the ground until he was hovering in the air. Then he was floating several feet in the air, his hair brushing the ceiling tiles as he continued to turn red, his face going from a deep crimson to an eggplant purple color. One of the students did me a favor, and with a snap of her fingers, the collar broke and fell from my neck, landing on the floor with a clang. I felt my strength flooding back. The other men in body armor were rushing over, pulling out secondary weapons and getting into firing range, hoping to stun us with tranquilizers. I saw a few of their shots hit their marks, and several students fell down unconscious in the hallway. With each kid who went down, Mr. Locke fell an inch lower, his face regaining its normal, pale shade. The men fired more tranquilizer darts, and several more kids fell over, looking like they were fast asleep afterwards. A few of the men started moving towards me. They grabbed me and started pulling me towards their APC. Mr. Locke now had his feet firmly on the ground, as the kids were shot with tranquilizer darts one by one. With a concerted effort, he started walking towards the APC. But then he looked down and saw my collar was missing. Stop! Where's the collar? He yelled, backing away from me. There's another one in the vehicle. Come on, it's just him. There's no threat from only one of them. We had been trained since a young age to work together at the Academy. We were a unit, which would one day be unleashed on a foreign military when World War III inevitably came around. Typically, only one psychic commando was not very powerful, especially at our young age. But I had shown my aptitude. I was a prodigy. Not him! He's too strong! Get the collar, quick! Mr. Locke was screaming now, running towards the exit. But it was too late. My head had started to clear, and I could feel my power returning. I reached out my hand and pulled the teacher back toward us, his feet skidding noisily across the linoleum tiles. He zipped backwards as if pulled by an invisible string, and then was standing just beside me. You don't deserve to be in this school, I told him, turning my hand as if twisting a light bulb. His neck snapped and he collapsed on the floor a second later. The sounds of guns being raised and pointed at my head could be heard on all sides of me, as the men took aim. With a thought, I plucked the rifles from their hands and sent them flying down the hallway towards the trophy case a hundred yards away. They slid across the floor and hit the wall with a clatter. Suddenly the men were unarmed, looking at me with stunned faces as I stood in the midst of them. They began to run, but were not fast enough. I reached out both my hands as they stumbled away, screaming and terrified. Why are you guys leaving so soon? I asked, their legs breaking from the power of my thoughts, their ankles snapping at 90 degree angles as I hobbled them using only my mind. They came skidding down the hall back towards me, sliding on their backs as they howled and were pulled on a conveyor belt of blood. We always need more practice dummies around here. And you idiots will do nicely. Housing prices are a nightmare, and renting can be worse with some apartments. I never understood paying over a grand to stay at a place per month if I could put that towards a mortgage. If only the banks saw things my way as well. I needed to find a place I could afford, and I got desperate, so I bought a house no one with any kind of sense would even consider. I found myself standing in an unfinished basement with a nervous real estate agent. His professional suit looked out of place in a dark and creepy basement like this. So, uh, you think I can paint over this? I asked him, trying to break the ice. We both stared at a pentagram carved into the stained cement. It also was painted over with red spray paint with odd writing around the circle. The stains in the middle of the gruesome symbol were blood, but confirmed from a chicken. The house I was thinking of buying had been foreclosed five years ago. It stood empty, and a group of edgy teens took it over. They used the basement to try and summon demons or got drunk. A couch sat off in the corner, and if I bought this house, I needed to pay someone to take the couch and burn it. 
I had no idea what the stains were on the cushions, and I never wanted to find out. Besides the basement, the rest of the house really wasn't that bad. We went over the rest of the house for the next few minutes. The structure had no issues, and the water heater still worked. The house lacked heat right now, but I could get a small space heater if I needed. I lived in a hotter part of the country, so some sweaters and two pairs of socks would work until I could afford to install heat. My plan was to buy the house at a rock-bottom price, and then work on it over the next few years. I could afford to buy it. Who really cared about a crappy pentagram in the basement? It's not as if those things actually did anything. My real estate agent looked very happy to get the property off his hands in such a pain-free way. At least no murders happened in the house, and no one claimed it was haunted. I bought the house, changed the locks, and put in a security camera at the front and back doors, in case those kids thought about coming back. I moved in my few items and got trying to work on the house. I got rid of the couch first thing. I found an old TV and DVD player hooked up downstairs, and dread came over my body when I found an old box of horror movies. I sold the TV and DVD player for a little bit of cash, and tossed the horror DVDs. I had very bad memories associated with most of them. They weren't even good movies, either. All low budgets with plots that made no sense. The one was borderline pornographic, and it held most of my worst memories. I burned that disc and forced myself to forget about it. I found out that the pentagram would take some work to remove. They carved it into the cement flooring. I had no idea how to fix it. I needed to talk to some of my contacts I made through work and see if they could do something for me. I mean, I could mix my own cement and fill it in, right? But what if I didn't use the right cement and it chipped off after I painted? No. Best to let someone who knew what they were doing fix it. I didn't have a time limit and wasn't worried. I just removed the paint and got rid of the chicken blood as best as I could. The first month was uneventful. I contacted someone to do the basement flooring, but he couldn't get to it for another month or so. I showed some co-workers photos of the basement before I cleaned it, and the jerk started to call my house the murder house. I kept telling them no one had ever died in the basement, but they refused to drop it. I do some work relating to low-budget horror movies. A director said he would pay me a hundred bucks if I would let him repaint the pentagram and let him use the basement for a set. I refused. I didn't want a small crew coming through my place for a month or so for shooting, and he was the kind of director who picked up side projects. He worked with some girls producing homemade, adult-oriented horror content. I didn't judge him for that, but didn't want my basement to be recognized, because those sorts of videos go around online. He found someone else with an even creepier unfinished basement, fine with a pentagram and props, so it was no loss on his part. I kept telling myself I wouldn't let the look of the basement start freaking me out. No murders in this house. It wasn't haunted. I had nothing to worry about. Then, odd things started to happen no matter how much I wanted to dismiss them. First, I started to hear noises at night. I woke up needing to go to the bathroom at 2 a.m. My body was on a timer I've never been able to fix. No matter when I drink last, I need to pee at 2 in the morning. I struggled out of bed and braced myself for the cold darkness. I needed to pull up my sweater soon. A scratching noise made me stop. I strained my ears, listening, and even brought my feet back under the blankets in case a bug or rodent was moving around under my bed. After a few minutes, that sound went away. I tried to place what I'd heard. I slowly went out into the hallway and turned on every light and looked for any traces of what the noise could have been. After 30 minutes of looking, I heard a tree branch tapping against a window in a spare room. It was close enough to the sound I thought I heard. The next day, I trimmed back the branches, thinking the nightly noises would be solved. Either way, the branches needed to be cut. I'd forgotten about the noise until I came home late one night. The sun had already set, and I came inside to get ready to crash for the rest of the night. My job kept me for too long, and I just wanted to shower, then sleep. I walked past the living room and noticed a box had fallen over. I owned a lot of horror movies. And I mean a lot. I tended to get a few copies from other people I worked with. I sometimes had doubles of the same movie and stored them in boxes. It felt wrong donating gifts, so I kept them to slowly give them to others who may enjoy the movies more. 
With people getting into streaming services, it got harder dumping DVDs on fans. I knew if I didn't put them away now, I wouldn't do it for another week. I didn't know how the box fell over in the first place. I thought the small stack was stable. I packed them away, but one case wasn't fully closed. I noticed when I picked it up and grimaced at the title. It was the worst movie I worked on, and the one I already burnt a copy of. A friend signed this one, so I had to keep it. I shut the case and realized it was empty after handling it. The disc should be rattling around in the cheap plastic case. I looked around for the DVD, wondering if I forgot it in the move. No loss if I did. I saw the DVD player was on. I hadn't touched that thing in over a year besides moving it. Actually, I didn't even remember plugging it in. I reached over and pressed the button for it to open the tray, and saw the missing DVD resting on it. I then went around to double-check the locks to try to figure out if someone had gotten inside my house. My cameras didn't pick up anyone breaking in, and nothing besides the DVD had been moved. I must have done this while getting a snack in the morning. I once fell asleep in the middle of eating a piece of bread at 3 in the morning, after I got up to use the washroom. If I had passed out eating, it was possible I put the movie on in the middle of the night and forgot all about it. The only other options were someone broke in without my security camera seeing, and only messed with one thing, or my house was haunted. A ghost who knew how to use a DVD player and wanted to watch some bad horror movies? Not likely. I told my coworkers the next day and they laughed it off with me. Some were starting to give me some spiritual protection stuff as a joke. Some sage, some table salt, and one got me one of those salt lamps. I dumped all of their thoughtful gifts beside the front door, ready to forget about them. A month went by and I started to get uneasy. I was either sleepwalking a lot or going crazy. I heard small noises in the night, but they all had an explanation to them. From the wind to a mouse I caught and set free outside. I started to notice missing food. Not much, just enough for me to question it. I added another camera, just in case a homeless person broke in somehow and was living inside my cupboards. I checked over the house a few times, seeing no signs of anyone living in the walls or attic. Then something happened that I couldn't ignore. I got done working on repainting the god-awful kitchen cabinets and came into the living room to eat when I noticed something. The box of DVDs was open, the cardboard flap sticking straight up. I went over to check on it and found a few spaces of missing DVDs. That was weird, but the weirder thing was I finally noticed my DVD player was missing. I barely ever used it, so I didn't even see the empty space on the shelf until I stared directly at it. It was one that opened up with a very small screen, but you could also plug it into your TV. I looked all over for that damn thing and to see if I saw any signs of someone breaking in. I still wasn't sure if I had a very crafty person secretly living with me, or if I was walking around moving things asleep at night. The last place I looked was the basement. I hated it down there and did laundry as little as possible to avoid it. I found the DVD player hidden away in a dark corner, plugged in and with missing movies half hidden under an old sheet I'd been meaning to throw out. I collected the items and booked it upstairs, freaked out. I barely slept that night, even after putting a chair under my doorknob in case someone was getting into my place. I didn't want to go to the cops just yet. I didn't have proof, so I set up some cameras inside my house. Just a few to catch me sleepwalking or whatever else was happening. I caved and hired someone to bless the house, feeling stupid over the entire thing. It didn't cost too much, and what was the harm? If they were going around blessing houses instead of a real job, they clearly needed the cash. I spoke with a friend of mine who suggested I might have pissed off one of the actors I work with, and they started messing with me. They could know a person who could hack into my camera feeds and make it seem like they weren't breaking into my place and moving things around. He suggested setting up some that weren't hooked up on Wi-Fi and recorded to a cloud storage, but instead went directly to an internal storage to be reviewed later. I took his advice and kept a camera hidden pointing towards the front door under some coats. The noises in the night were starting to get to me. I even put a line of salt over the bathroom and my bedroom doorway. Couldn't hurt, right? And ghosts didn't like salt, right? With how little I slept, it wasn't likely I was behind moving things around while sleepwalking. 
I needed to get to the bottom of this. When my friend cemented over the pentagram, I finally got a full eight hours of rest. I didn't realize what kind of effect that thing had on me until it was gone. The second night after the basement was returned to normal, all hell broke loose. Noises above my head woke me up from a deep sleep. I jumped out of bed listening to something moving around in the attic. I wrapped the blankets around me, heart racing. I listened, trying to gather the courage to go up and see what the hell was up there. My teeth clamped tightly together from the fear of hearing rustling and moving above my head. A chattering from the attic, and my fear faded a bit. I thought I knew that kind of sound. I needed to put the pull-out ladder in the hallway to double-check, though. I would be pissed at myself if I got this scared at something I suspected to be up there. I grabbed some gloves, an old mask from one of the movies for protection. I pulled on the string to the ladder, and dust came drifting down. I very slowly brought the ladder down, not wanting the thing in the attic to realize a new opening appeared and fled into the house. I took the steps one by one, careful not to make any noise. I only put my head through enough to look around. The attic was cramped and smelled like years of dust built up. I switched the flashlight on. The chattering came again, and I directed the light toward it. Two eyes reflected back in the darkness. We both froze in fear, seeing each other. More of the warning chatters came, and I sighed, seeing a very scared raccoon looking back at me. This house had been closed up for five years. I should have checked out the roof to see if any animals could get in. I wasn't in the mood to get a rabies shot, so I slowly backed down. I closed the attic, ready to call someone to deal with my new roommate in the morning. At least it didn't go for my face. This cheap mask wouldn't really do much to protect me. I didn't think I could sleep that night. I left the house, giving the raccoon some space. I spent the rest of the night getting food at any places still open, and driving around until I felt tired. I got back home before the sun rose. I hoped my new friend already left. Feeling tired as hell, I climbed the stairs, ready for bed. Even knowing all my issues had perfectly reasonable explanations, I never cleaned up the salt lines. I felt foolish putting them down and even bothering burning the gifted sage. Now with the raccoon, I've been able to explain away nearly every strange event in the house. The salt had been useless and was disappearing over time from me stepping on them by accident. Or I assume that's what happened to the salt. I must have been very quiet getting home and going up the stairs, because the other mystery roommate of mine didn't hear me. I wished it was just another raccoon roaming my house. I could have dealt with that. I reached the top of the stairs mid-yawn, and didn't see what waited for me at first. At the bathroom doorway was a shape that made me freeze. My body refused to move no matter how much I wanted to scream. Something was hunched over, face against the floor, licking up the remaining salt with a long, tube-like tongue. It sensed me looking at it, and the head raised up, tangled black hair covering most of its face. The part of the face I saw nearly made me faint. I'd been stepping towards my bedroom, and instead of trying to escape by running down the stairs, I only took a single step forward when the creature moved. It crawled up the walls and along the ceiling on six arms that were hidden under the long black hair. It dropped on top of me, pinning my body to the ground. The long and crooked fingers dug into my arms trying to keep me still. I kicked trying to get away. In my struggle, I only moved upwards by a few inches, but that made my sweater slip up to expose my stomach, like an invitation for the monster to dig right in. The face drew back, and to my horror started to open up into sections. I worked on horror movies, and since they were so low budge, we could never manage a creature like this. All the monsters I've seen were terrible CGI or craftwork splashed with a gallon of fake blood. The real thing was so much more terrifying, I screamed louder than I ever had before. I kept screaming, unable to do anything, as that mouth filled with pointed teeth traveling down into a pitch black hole of a throat got closer. My lungs emptied and I found myself coughing with tears in my eyes. The mouth so close and yet it didn't take my face off. It slowly started to close back up to a more 
almost human face. The nose a bit flat and eyes wide and dark. It stared down and I gasped for air, mind blank from fear. Michael Mills? The monster spoke in a low and raspy tone. I stayed still stunned. It knew my name? Well, of course, if it had been inside the house for a while, it could have figured out my name easily enough. When it spoke again, it explained why it knew my name. I felt fear, but for an entirely different reason. Dean Scream, Body Killers Part 3? Raspy voice, the same as any random horror fan I've come across in public. I started to shake my head. I would rather be eaten than anyone talk about that damn movie. It was the first one I agreed to be in, and it ruined my life. I needed the money in college. I needed the cash real bad. I cannot understate that fact. My dorm mate asked me to be an extra in a low-budget movie, and I ended up being the lead role after the other actor backed out. It got me a few hundred bucks, and I thought doing an adult scene wouldn't be too bad. I mean, it wasn't real, right? I wasn't actually doing the deed on film, it was just shot as if I was. I did my job and tried to move on with my life. When the movie was released, a few other directors called me for other smaller parts. It changed the course of my life to be doing minor acting parts, but thankfully with no scenes as graphic as the first one. When I didn't find parts, I was offered to work on set and got pretty good at applying zombie or ghost makeup. I didn't even want to work on low-budget horror films like this. I had no chance of actually becoming a real actor, and no one would ever hire me for something decent due to the movies I'd agreed to be in. I went to school for accounting, for God's sake. I thought through all of this to put off the mortification of the monster seeing that movie and recognizing me from it. Oh, please just kill me. I begged and half meant it. The monster let go of my arms and backed up. We both sat in the hallway, it sitting like a dog. All the arms moving around, unsure of what to do. The creature wearing some torn up and stitched together clothing of mine I thought I had lost in the move around its waist. The chest flat, so I assumed it to be a guy. This all begged the question of what this thing was and why it watched horror movies. Have you been the one behind all the noises and things moving around? I asked, arms sore from where he grabbed me. He kept looking everywhere but my direction. When I pulled down my sweater, he was finally able to make eye contact. I tried some food, too. Not great. Like the floor stuff. He commented in that creepy, raspy voice. Salt works great for demons and ghosts, my ass. I wondered why the salt lamp looked a bit thin on one side. He must have been licking at that, too. I reasonably wanted to be pissed off at this monster, but got lucky that he wasn't eating my face off. Can you leave and not kill me? What even are you and what are you doing in my house to start with? I asked, hoping for good answers. I came through from far away with a spell made in the ground. I'm stuck in this building. Cannot leave. You ruined the way back when I slept. No way of getting home. What I am, not sure. Just me. What are you? Besides food and a story man, he asked, eyes unblinking in my direction. Goddamn goth kids. They did bring a creature back through their pentagram. They either didn't know what they did or saw this creature and bolted to not come back again. I ignored being food comment. I understood him not knowing what I was or what to call himself. He wasn't human and was from a different world. I got extremely lucky I wasn't dealing with something that had more teeth. He must have been inside this house alone long enough to figure out how to work the TV and DVD player to watch the movies left behind. What were the chances I bought a house that a monster who was a fan of that trash was trapped inside of? Can I remake the pentagram and send you back? I offered. Not likely. You can try. May I request... Information. He asked suddenly, and I backed up, seeing a mouth full of sharp teeth after he smiled. I nodded and tensed up, ready for him to attack again. Do you know of a... Part four? 
he asked, ignoring my personal space, and got up close to my face. I crawled back, trying to get away, only to have that ghastly face get closer and closer. Our noses nearly touching, and I lost my balance, falling backwards. The monster got out a pair of arms to catch me before I hit the ground. Uh, yes, there is, but my character died in the first two minutes, so I never watched it. Or got a copy. I admitted, heart beating from fear, staring at those endless pitch-black eyes. Oh. He sounded really disappointed. The face pulled away, and he lifted me back up so I was sitting again, and not bending my back trying to get away from him. Again, I considered if death might be better. When he spoke again, I decided yes. I wanted to die, instead of suffering through our next conversation. Screams taste good as flesh. The part of story, with you and the girl screaming, tasted the best of all those stories. I do not know why it took so long of you stabbing her for her to die. But it was very enjoyable. I really wanted to die. I buried my face in my hands, not wanting to see that nightmare of a face looking so innocent. He really misunderstood that part. He brought up my traumatic dark past as if it was nothing. In the movie, I did stab the character after the terribly embarrassing act ended, but that was not all that happened in that scene. Uh, we weren't... I only stabbed her once, I corrected, feeling like I wanted to cry from embarrassment. An awkward silence came over us for a solid minute that felt like ten years. He broke it by a small sound that made it clear he clued into why I felt so mortified. I am unsure of my current emotion, he admitted, and I didn't want to hear that either. You should have just eaten me, I commented and pulled my hands away from my face. Getting back on track, I need to get rid of you. How can I do that? To my sheer horror, the monster shrugged all of its arms. This had been the worst night of my life. He looked over towards my room and then got back on all fours. After a big stretch, the creature yawned. I could see the darkness in the hallway getting brighter, showing the sun would be rising soon. I must sleep. We talk. Later, right? Fine. Later? I sat dumbfounded. This thing was going to stay inside my house. I opened my mouth to ask it again how to remove him from my house, when the monster's body started to sink into the hardwood floor. He told me again we would speak later, and disappeared before my eyes. I was stuck with a creature because I bought a place thinking a pentagram in the basement wasn't a big deal. A noise made me jump showing the raccoon was still in the attic. At least I could deal with one freeloader. I went to work dead tired, but needed to take my mind off what happened. The bruises on my arms proved the encounter happened, or I really had lost my mind and did it to myself. I didn't really tell my co-workers what I saw that night, worried about their responses. I arrived home expecting to see the creature the moment I walked inside the door. I considered renting out a hotel room, but my wallet said otherwise. The cost of safely removing the raccoon hurt my savings. Somehow I passed out on the couch, only to be rudely awoken by a pale face inches away from my own. I screamed and pushed the monster off, yelling he needed to not scare me like that. When my heart slowed down, we had a short talk about him hanging around. We both doubted I could figure out the right spell to send him home. Even if I could find an object, he claimed to have enough magic to send him back. He was stuck there for good, it seemed. I could move, but where would I go? The money I would make from selling the place wouldn't cover anything decent. I was as stuck as the monster. The upside was, he agreed not to eat me. Yet. His words hit a thread of not being able to hold back from taking a pound of flesh if I didn't provide him with a different food source. He could eat the terror and screams and other meat like raw beef or pork. I was a bad actor, so my fake screams didn't do the job. I needed to let him jump scare me at least once every two days or so to keep him pleasant enough to live with. He also said that he could eat the fear from a recorded scream if a different creature hadn't gotten to it first. I handed over an old iPad with headphones for him to look through YouTube videos at night, trying to find a meal or two. Most nights he didn't have much luck, making me extremely nervous over just how many monsters there might be out in the world. I don't know how my life got to this point. 
I got stuck in a job I felt embarrassed doing for the most part. And with a house I can't move out of. The threat of not providing enough food made me scared enough to give my new roommate a meal or two a week. I hated living in dread of him jumping out from a dark corner at any second. The waiting for it to happen really was the worst part of the deal. After a few weeks of being forced to live with each other, the monster crawled out into the darkness of the hallway and announced he decided on the name Teddy, and then crawled over the ceiling to do who knows what. I think he's really out to kill me. How on earth can I be that scared of him when he pulls that kind of crap? Teddy? Really? I better land a really good acting job that can pay for me to move out of this place. Or else I'm gonna be eaten. Because this roommate of mine is really growing on me. My first month on the job went without incident. I was hired as head chef seeing how Ray, the previous chef, quit unexpectedly. The pub, which was originally built in the late 1700s, then rebuilt in 1823, is located in downtown Ancaster, a quiet village in southern Ontario. The pub seats roughly 60 people, and boasts live music four nights a week. It's a cozy room, and the food is fantastic, if I do say so myself. Sometime last week, as I was delivering a tray of steaming hot glasses to the bar, I saw my first ghost. It was a Sunday, I remember. The pub was dead. Only one table remained. The patrons were finishing their drinks, and discussing how they would split the bill. Sitting alone at the end of the bar was a woman who may have been in her early forties. She was well-dressed and well-postured, and wore a large, broad-brimmed hat and a thin, gauzy white dress. There was a sadness surrounding her, but I was busy working, so I paid her little notice. All I wanted was for this shift to end, and pronto, so I could enjoy a cold, refreshing pint. Brenna, the bartender that evening, hurried past me, all the while ignoring the woman sitting at the bar who was without a drink. Um, I think that woman needs a drink, I said to Brenna. Or her bill. I regretted these words as soon as I'd spoken them. Never tell a bartender how to do their job, right? That said, I couldn't figure out why Brenna, who's a wonderful barkeep, would allow a customer to sit unserved for so long. Brenna glanced towards the bar where the woman was seated and frowned. There's no one sitting at the bar, she said, sounding very much annoyed. I thought Brenna was teasing me, since I'm the new guy and all. But when I checked, the woman sitting at the bar was gone. I was stunned. I wanted to say something clever, but for the first time in my life, I was lost for words. Instead, I made a joking gesture like I was kidding with her, then scampered back to the kitchen to finish my work. When the kitchen was closed and my work completed, I bounced back to the bar, anxiously awaiting my after-work pint. I sat tepidly at the bar, drinking my beer. My mind was racing. I couldn't stop thinking about that woman wearing the hat. Was she a hallucination? Probably she was. I chose to sit at the opposite end of the bar, just in case. That said, it's a modest-sized bar, so I was still within spitting distance of where the woman was sitting. I finished my beer and soon forgot about the mysterious woman. I was ready for home. I was putting on my coat and scarf, bracing for the icy weather waiting for me outside, when I spotted the woman from the corner of my eye. Gotcha, I snapped, looking across the bar to where she was sitting. Only, when I checked, she had vanished. I rubbed my eyes and shook my head. I must be losing it, I thought to myself, unhappily. Maybe it was stress. Wearily, I left for home. I couldn't get the woman sitting in the bar out of my head. Was she real, or was my mind playing tricks on me? Maybe this was some elaborate prank the other staff members were playing on me. It could be, but that was highly unlikely. Maybe I really was losing it. When I returned to work a couple nights later, I felt better. It was trivia night, which meant the pub would be packed. It was. Work was beyond strenuous. The kitchen, which was hot enough to scald a loon, looked more like a war zone than a place to prepare food. Sometime after 8 o'clock, when it died down a bit, I took my dinner break. 
I sat at the edge of the bar and ate my burger in silence. I was famished. As I was dipping my french fries into a giant glob of ketchup lost in my thoughts, I spotted the woman sitting at the bar. Beside her was a group of large men, who were drinking and roaring and having a good time. This woman, on the other hand, remained eerily quiet. It was like she wanted to go unnoticed. As Brenna whizzed past me, I motioned to the woman sitting at the bar. Brenna shot me a stern look. What now? She snapped. It was obvious she didn't like me. Maybe because I was filthy and I smelled like fish bait. You're pointing to the only spot no one's sitting in. You do know this, right? Huh? When I peeked past the men drinking at the bar, the mysterious woman was gone. I gasped. Brenna, on the other hand, muttered some choice words under her breath and sauntered off to serve some drinks. I was too frightened to so much as even glance across the bar to where, up until a moment ago, the woman wearing the hat was seated. But if she wasn't really sitting there, then how come her bar stool remained vacant? This was peculiar because the pub was jam-packed. Every table and chair were filled except for hers. It was as if some unknown force was preventing people from sitting there. This made zero sense. I was becoming unhinged. Nothing made sense to me at that moment. As I was heading back to the kitchen, I felt a pair of eyes following me. I knew who it was. It was the woman sitting at the bar. When I glanced over my shoulder, sure enough, she was back sitting at the bar. When I took a step toward her, however, she disappeared again. Poof. Just like that, she was gone. I resisted the urge to scream. Instead, I scooted back to the kitchen where I belonged. As impassively as possible, I asked Dave, the line cook who was working with me that night, about the haunted history of the pub. I had heard rumors of such, but chalked them up to folklore. Dave ignored me. Instead, he put five pounds of chicken wings into the deep fryer, then pulled out a tray of nachos from the oven. I asked him again. Dave remained silent for an uncomfortable length of time. Eventually, he looked up from the plate of nachos he was dressing and scrutinized me. Are you serious? He asked. Or are you just being a jerk? This wasn't the response I was expecting. When I mentioned the woman sitting at the bar, his eyes lit up. You've seen her? He asked. He was unable to contain his excitement. Wow, that's cool. I've only ever heard of her. We went back to work. Dave pulled the wings from the deep fryer, shook off the grease, applied the appropriate sauces, then plated them. I rang the bell, and the server quickly came to retrieve them. The subject of the woman sitting at the bar didn't come up again until sometime after work. Sitting at the table closest to the bar, I bought Dave an after-work pint, which he guzzled down with glee. Afterward, I ordered us another round. I wanted to loosen his lips. She was sitting right there. I pointed to the stool at the end of the bar, next to the warmly decorated fireplace with the rose-colored stockings hanging from the mantel. Dave peeked over my shoulder. He smiled nervously. Then he leaned in close to me and whispered, Have you ever been to the basement? I shook my head. The basement is where we store kegs and random cleaning supplies, but mostly it's where junk goes to die. The next round of drinks arrived. We cheersed. Dave took a generous gulp, wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his Metallica shirt, then looked me dead in the eyes. This pub is definitely haunted, he said just above a whisper. Has been for as long as anyone can remember. Personally, I haven't seen any ghosts. But Ray, Ray told me some stories. Creepy stories. Which included this lady you're describing. Ray hated this place, especially the basement. Probably why he quit. Dave paused to drink. Do you know the history of this pub? This town, in fact? I didn't. The town of Ancaster's old. Well, old for this part of the world. Across the streets where they kept the gallows. That's where they hanged war criminals, traitors, and your run-of-the-mill ruffians. They hanged a lot of men during the War of 1812. 
They were ruthless about it, too. Did you know that the bloodiest sentence they ever handed down to this day happened here? They executed 15 men, all of whom were charged with treason. Gets better. These same prisoners resided right here in this very building, waiting for those nasty nooses to snap their necks like twigs. The most dangerous men were detained in the basement, where they were tortured and tormented and God knows what else. I've been down there. It's creepy as hell. The floor is gray dirt. The walls are dark and dingy. Plus it smells musty and old. I hate it down there. Dave's words filled me with dread. More beer was required, I realized, so I ordered us another round. We sat in silence waiting for the beer to arrive. I was trying to wrap my mind around what Dave had just told me. I honestly knew nothing of this town's twisted past. It was around this time that I spotted the woman sitting at the end of the bar. Only now she was facing me. My stomach filled with butterflies. Fear was creeping into my body like an unwanted guest. The beer arrived. We drank, then Dave continued where he left off, and I did my best to ignore the apparition staring at me. There must be a record somewhere that shows the total number of prisoners executed here, Dave said in between sips of beer. Whatever it is, it's sure a hell of a lot. Maybe that's why this place is haunted. I pondered all this for a moment. Up until a few days ago, the idea of ghosts being real seemed ludicrous. I've made fun of people for believing in such hogwash. Now look at me. I'm discussing the ghosts of dead prisoners while being surveyed by a woman sitting at the bar that apparently only I can see. I stole another glance over my shoulder. The woman was indeed watching me. Dave looked at me curiously. She's back, isn't she? He asked. I nodded. It took all my energy not to completely freak out. This was all new to me. Dave turned to face the empty bar stool, where the ghost woman was sitting, and stared for an incredible length of time. He was squinting. Damn, I see nothing, he said. But I do feel something strange coming over me. Probably my imagination. Dave finished his last swallow of ale. Then he started gathering his things. His face was pale. His eyes seemed far away. He thanked me for the beer, said goodbye to Brenna, then left. He quit the next day. By now I had a decent beer buzz, which under normal circumstances would have been great, but not on this particular evening. I was downright spooked. I could still feel the ghost woman scrutinizing me with her dour, dead eyes, which added to my misery. I needed to split, and fast, before I lost my mind altogether. I began organizing my belongings, doing my best to ignore the ashen lady staring at me from her seat at the bar. As I was about to leave the pub, Brenna came rushing over. Tony, can you please go down to the basement and bring me up a keg of Coors Light? She seemed flustered. She had been waiting on a large table who seemed hell-bent on partying all night. Suddenly, I found myself trembling like an earthquake. My hands were cold and clammy. My legs as sturdy as a unicycle. The last thing I wanted to do was venture down to that basement. Not after what David just told me. But I did it anyways. What choice did I have? The stairwell leading down to the basement was close-fitting. I'm tall, so I had to crouch to avoid knocking my head clean off. I descended slowly and cautiously down the wobbly wooden stairs, trying my best to be brave. It wasn't working. I was scared shitless. The basement was poorly lit. The air was thick and gross. I could smell mold plus something else I couldn't quite describe. If Haunted had an odor, this would be it. A discarded Budweiser sign lay in twisted ruins at the bottom of the stairs. Stacks of cardboard boxes lined the stone brick walls which were the color of dead fish. As I reached the bottom step, I tripped over a dead rat, causing me to whack my head on the edge of the ceiling. It hurt like hell. I kicked the rat carcass across the room and rubbed my aching head. At the opposite end of the basement, soiled in silvery spider webs, was a mop bucket. It was filthy. Next to it was a rusted old meat slicer that looked to be 40 years old at least. 
straight ahead of me, leaning haphazardly against the wall, were the kegs. I found the keg labeled Coors Light. I bent down and carefully picked it up, trying not to whack my head on the low ceiling again. As I was standing at the base of the stairs, ready to return to the main floor, I felt a cool breeze brush against my face. Then the basement light started flickering on and off in sudden flashes. I heard sobbing. The sound was close. Someone was down here with me. My anxiety level was skyrocketing. Then came a strange, garbling noise which scared me stupid. I dropped the keg on my big toe, crushing it. The keg clanked and clacked and crawled along the grimy basement floor before coming to an abrupt halt. After dropping an inflammatory F-bomb, I scanned the vicinity, searching for whoever was down there with me. That's when I felt something touch the back of my neck. I spun around in surprise. No one was there. By now, my heart was threatening to explode from my chest, and even though the temperature in the basement was frigid, I was sweating buckets. Fear had stolen over me. The walls were closing in. I was becoming claustrophobic. I was scared out of my mind. I took a deep breath and held it for six seconds, trying to regain some composure. Then I let out a nervous laugh and started ascending the stairs. That's when I heard a voice cry out for help. This put a jump to my step. I was halfway up the stairs before I realized I'd forgotten the keg. I scampered back down the stairs, trying to ignore the terror growing inside of me, and fetch the damn keg. That's when I heard the voice again. This time, I stopped to have a listen. I knew this was a bad idea, but I did it anyways. I couldn't help myself. Someone was sobbing. The sound was coming from behind the stairwell. I turned my attention to the spandrel behind the stairwell, and saw the most extraordinary sight. I gazed, mouth ajar, petrified. What I saw has forever altered my perception of reality. I'm still trying to come to grips with it. Maybe that's what compelled me to share this story. Make it official, so to speak. As I crept toward the stairwell, I noticed a group of gaunt-looking men huddled together, hiding in the cubbyhole behind the stairs. They were chained to the wall, clad in wretched rags, which matched their filthy, malnourished faces. I knew they weren't real because they were shimmering like a mirage in the desert. Yet they were. Right in front of me. The sight of these men broke my heart. I don't care what these men did, this was simply inhumane. I squinted, hoping to get a better look at them. The men were neck to neck, grunting and groaning. One man was weeping profusely, his head buried in his bloodied, soiled hands. Then I heard bullwhips cracking, followed by a chorus of screams. I let out a pathetic whimper, and when I did, the men dissolved into thin air. By now I was feeling sick to my stomach. I rushed to the bottom of the stairs and looked up at the speck of light peeking from behind the entrance. Sluggishly, I began my journey back up the slender stairwell. I heard bullwhips cracking again, followed by tortured, grief-stricken pleas for mercy, and I almost jumped out of my skin. This was getting ridiculous. I needed to leave this basement as quickly as possible. So, with the keg snug in my arms, I scooted upstairs and slammed the basement door shut once and for all. The urge to break down and cry was tremendous. I'd never been so scared in my life. When I delivered the keg to Brenna, she looked at me peculiarly. Jeez, you look like you've seen a ghost, she said. I let out one lowly laugh. Then I scrambled for my belongings and beelined for the exit. As I was leaving, something compelled me to stop and I turned around. It was now past closing time. The pub was silent. The chairs sat on top of tables, ready for their nightly slumber. The bar stools rested, empty and taciturn. All except for one. The woman sitting at the bar reappeared. She was looking straight at me. The corners of her lips raised in what could have been a smile. For a moment, I simply regarded her. Her auburn hair spilled out from her eloquent straw hat, her hairs like black pearls. I waved goodbye to her as I left. 
and collapsed on my bed the moment I got home. I slept like the dead. The following morning, I sent this email to Rachel, the owner of the Coach and Lantern. Dear Rachel, Although my time at the Coach and Lantern has been short-lived, it's been both enjoyable and educational. You run a fine pub. That said, I hereby give you my two weeks' notice. Although I am grateful for the opportunity you've provided me, I feel it is time for a career change. I want to write horror stories. Yes, it's time I write about ghosts and haunted houses and evil spirits and such. Sounds like fun, right? One last thing. I won't be venturing into the basement again. Ever. Best of luck to you and your pub. Tony Starr My dear family, I hope you can find it in you to honor the wish of an old man and indulge his silly fancies. You may think me dramatic, mad even, but there's a reason for my wish. A reason I swore to the Lord God I'd never tell a soul for as long as I lived. And yet I know you're all wondering, given my devotion to the gospel, why I never entered a church and was opposed to being buried in the family plot. It's because of what happened more than a half century ago. Because of the fall of Father Asher. You all know I was drafted into the National Militia as part of the Volkssturm. A boy no older than 16, forced to partake in the madness that was the final year of the war. During those weeks, I bore witness to the worst atrocities of man, the demons hidden deep inside every last one of us. After our surrender to the Americans, I became a prisoner of war and was subjected to the hardest labor. The only thing that gave me solace, made it all bearable, was the word of God. After more than a year, I was finally allowed to return home but our picturesque little village was almost unrecognizable. The roads, the buildings, the wide meadows and rich forests, they were all still there, but not the people. So many of us had set out for war, were forced to, and so few returned. Even our village, this remote speck of the world, hadn't been left unscathed. Our small town's population had been reduced to scarcely more than the very old, the very young, and poor, widowed women. The air was heavy with misery. The war might have been over, but people had lost too much, had suffered too much, and now even their hope for the future was all but gone. Just like me, they sought solace in the gospel, the word of God. For that reason, every Sunday, the entire village set out to our small chapel to partake in the sermons held by our preacher, Father Asher. The chapel was a gloomy thing, and stood on a lonely hill, ways off from the village at the end of a dark and unruly tarn. It was supposed to be a house of God, but its atmosphere was one entirely different. It was a dull, unceremonious building, a sluggish construction, one of excessive antiquity that had been erected centuries ago during the village's earliest days. Its stones were discolored, the wood paneling half-rotten, giving it an aura of near pestilence. This age, this dilapidation, was most notable in a fissure that went through the bell tower and down the front of the building. The chapel's surroundings were no different. The graveyard's earth was sodden, perpetually muddy, the ground fresh as if constantly broken to prepare fresh graves. Most unsettling, however, was the tarn's fog. In the earliest hours of the day, it rose from the dark waters and covered the chapel grounds like mystic vapor. After my return, I ventured forth to pay the building a visit in order to pray to our Lord God. But its interior only intensified the gloomy feelings its exterior appearance gave it. The tapestries against the walls and the altar were colorless, the ebon floor stained and blacked with the accumulated soot of ages. 
Whenever the father held his sermons, he only ever lit a few select candles. But their dim glow was never enough to reach the chapel's more remote angles or its high ceiling. The rows of pews were as antiquated as the rest of the building. They were comfortless, worm-eaten things, and filled the chapel's air with an almost oppressive, musty odor. Similarly to the village itself, the chapel too was a place heavy with sorrow, albeit of a different kind. I quickly bonded with Father Asher. He was an older man, but he too had been forced to partake in the war, and had seen his share of atrocities. Thus, after his return, the man wanted to share what little light there was left in the world with his suffering congregation. I saw how much the war had changed Asher. When I was a young boy, the preacher had been a stout one, one full of life. Now his complexion was wan, his lips colorless, and his gait had become a limping shuffle caused by a crippling injury to his right leg. His features, however, were as fine as ever. He had a prominent chin, finely carved cheekbones, a delicate nose and eyes which were always sharp and luminous. He was of peculiar character, that man, a sensible sort of temperament, but I'd known no one as passionate for the word of God as him. It must have been this character that drove him to bid me for assistance at the chapel. Given how engrossed I'd become in the Bible and aspiring to become a man of the cloth myself, I was quick to agree. Thus I became the father's altar servant whenever my duties at the family farm allowed me to. Much like the rest of us, the father was a man with troubles of his own, namely in the form of his family, specifically his sister. She was a woman scarcely few people even remembered, or had never actually known about. I only learned of her one night when I spied an apparition, wandering the graveyard during the hour of twilight. She was an ethereal thing, one entirely without complexion, I only watched from afar, frozen by the strange vision in front of me. When the father saw whereupon my gaze fell, I learned that said apparition was indeed his sister, Marguerite. She suffered, the man told me, from a strange condition, one that made her walk in her sleep and her thoughts drift during what few brief hours she was awake. Further, it made her weak in body and she could only stomach the smallest variety of food. For this reason, the preacher continued, she was almost always indoors, in his small lodgings at the side of the church, first cared for by their parents, and now by no one other than the father himself. I never gave it much thought, and I never saw her again until months later. It was in the late hours of the evening, and I made my way to the chapel to consult the Father on a certain passage within the Gospel. That night the tarn's vapor seemed different. It was heavy, enshrouding the chapel, making it seem like a thing that could only exist within a dream. From inside I heard sounds of the most hideous nature, a cacophony of shrill, high-pitched voices. Cracking open the chapel's door, I found its interior entirely warped, the feeble flames of the candles flared widely, and twisted shadows danced along the walls and the dull tapestries, as if they had a life of their own. My eyes quickly wandered to the altar, where the father stood but not alone. He was with a woman, a woman without complexion, his sister. With a horror that threatened to shatter my soul, I realized that the pair were committing a sin far worse than any other, the sin of flesh. The preacher's face was distorted, pained, almost delirious, as if taken by a fever of the most terrible kind. I could only watch in stunned horror, but when his sister threw her head back, I saw her face for the shortest of moments. It was a face unlike any I'd seen before a ghastly, distorted visage. Her eyes were wide, nothing but dark pupils, and her lips dripping with blood. In an instant, I dashed from the building in sheer terror, unsure of what I'd just witnessed. 
but certain that it was a cursed, unholy thing. Even now, as an old man, as I'm writing this, I remember lying in bed, unable to sleep. My mind was troubled, almost fevered by what I'd seen, by the heinous act committed by the man I respected most. Yet, as the hours ticked by, I wasn't so sure anymore what had transpired. What if it all had been nothing but a hallucination? A trick of the mind? After all, might it not have been one of the many horrors I'd witnessed during my conscription? Conjured up and altered by powers beyond my understanding? At least, that's what I told myself. Convinced myself of. Come morning, I set out to consult Father Asher to inquire what had happened the night before. But alas, I did not get the chance to do so. The prior night, tragedy had struck. On my way to the chapel, I learned that the preacher's long sick sister had died. Her demise, however, I was informed, came not from her peculiar type of illness, but was supposedly of her own choosing. When the father returned to his lodgings after his nightly prayers, He'd found her dead in their home, her face swollen and purple, her throat covered in dark red marks, the rope she'd used to hang herself with still fastened around her neck. It was a tragedy like none other. Death might have been ever occurring during these times, but this type of death, it was unheard of. Before long, a summon from the father himself reached me. He said it pained him terribly, but given his condition, his leg, he required assistance laying her to rest. When I arrived at the chapel, the man was already waiting for me at the door. He was a terrible figure to behold, one powerless and tired. His eyes were red, his hands shaking, his lips quivering, and it seemed his leg was even worse today. Yet as I followed his shuffling gait towards his abode, his resolve, his voice, they were steadfast. She's inside, but she's been prepared, the preacher said. That day I saw his lodgings for the first time. They comprised nothing but a few miserable rooms. In the center of one of them, Marguerite was propped up on a table. A white funeral gown enshrouded her body, hiding the marks of her terrible demise. I asked about the funeral, about the date and time, but the father informed me he'd take care of the required rites by himself. There's no need, he said, to make this death a public display, a celebration even during times like this. Too many people have died, and there's too much pain already, so much death. This here, it's my fault, and my fault alone. It's no one but me who's carrying this burden. Together, the two of us put the body into a cheaply made coffin before we carried it to the sodden graveyard beyond. The father had already prepared a grave, but it was scarcely more than a small, damp hole, one almost too small to fit Marguerite's casket. After we lowered it into the hole, the father approached the coffin. He opened it and tore aside the funeral gown, revealing Marguerite's face and allowing me to see it for the first time. For a moment, I saw the previous night's ghastly visage again and gasped as I imagined the she-beast jumping from her grave. Then it was gone, the memory torn aside just as the shroud which had covered her face. Marguerite's face was similar to the father's, almost strikingly so. I saw the same prominent chin, the same carved cheekbones, and a similarly delicate nose. I learned then that Marguerite wasn't merely the father's sister, but his twin sister. This face, however, wasn't without mark. Her condition and way of death had caused it to be purple and swollen, making it look as if of a slight blush, and had distorted her mouth into the semblance of a perpetual half-smile as if she'd chosen happily to part from this world and what must have been a most miserable existence. Eventually, the father bade me leave so he could finish the rites of burial. 
After a moment of hesitation, I honored his wish and left him alone to his devices. We all suffered and grieved in our own ways, after all. In the weeks after Marguerite's death, the father changed, markedly so. He became an almost unrecognizable figure. While he had always possessed a wan complexion, he became even more pale of skin, and his hair grew wild and unheeded, almost as if he was to change into something barely recognizable as human. It wasn't merely his appearance that changed, however, but also his character. Oftentimes his voice became trembling, quivering, as if he was perpetually terrified of something unnamed. At other moments he spoke energetically, rapidly, and intensely excited, especially during his sermons. By that point he almost exclusively recited from the book of Revelation. He spoke of Armageddon, but most of all, the beast of Revelation, the whore of Babylon. During these sermons the man was incomparable to the trembling, quivering husk he'd become. He was loud and boisterous as if intoxicated by his own words thundering them, ranting on feverishly and pleading the Lord for protection from the darkness, from sins and temptation. After these sermons, after the congregation left in a state of confusion and half-terror, the father took to walking the chapel's interior without object. Many times I saw him staring vacantly and listening to sounds not there, I thought it was the grief and suffrage brought forth by the death of his only living relative. Yet sometimes, I wondered if there might be a more terrible secret surrounding the father, one related to the night of Marguerite's death. When I talked to him about his condition, about his changes, he played it off as nothing but a nervous affection, a small onset of his sister's illness that seemed to have now passed on to him. It put him into a state of acuteness of sense, he said, and now he too was afflicted by various ailments. He was only able to sustain certain foods. The faintest of lights tortured his eyes, and even the odors outside were too powerful for him to endure. So he, similarly to his sister, spent most of his time indoors, in either the chapel or his small lodgings, on the rare occasion he ventured outside, it was only during the hour of twilight. Before long the father grew ever thinner, so thin indeed that he looked gaunt, half dead, and much older than he truly was. This got me worried, for I believe he suffered not merely from a small onset of illness, but a terrible sickness of body and mind. In these latter days, he eventually approached me and confided in me that I was to take over the chapel. Taken aback, I inquired what he meant, and after a deep sigh, he said he knew he was to perish soon. Yet, as he said these words, shared the future he thought awaited him, a shudder went through the man. As much as he wanted to accept it, he could not give himself to the idea wholeheartedly. For, he said, he was bound to this place, and what lay outside in its hidden depths. These ramblings not only confused, but scared me badly, and I soon found myself affected by them as well. I grew superstitious of not only the father, but also the chapel and its surroundings, especially the sodden graveyard, and the mysterious vapor that rose from the tarn beyond. This affection caused me many a sleepless night, like the father, I found myself pacing my home without objective, often almost unconsciously stealing glances at the chapel and its surroundings from the confines of my home. Whenever I did, I was filled with the state of deepest alarm and constantly listened for any and all sounds that reached me from the chapel. Then, one night, a night in which a terrible storm hailed upon the village, I spied the father outside, standing in front of the chapel's doors, unmoving. Worried about his health, I set out towards him. The chapel was almost entirely enshrouded by the tarn's vapors, which were intensified by the heavy rainfall. The father, however, just stood there, 
almost unaware of the terrible, raging storm. Let's go inside, Father. Uh, this weather is dangerous for your body, your, your condition. And thus, I led the priest inside. Only then did I notice the father was mumbling to himself. He talked again of sounds. Sounds, he said, were announcing the coming of the beast. The beast and its legions. I was quick to calm the man down and to assure him it was nothing but the thunder of the storm. And we were alone and safe here in the house of God. Finally, I suggested I'd read him from his favorite part of the Bible. The book of Revelation. So you can calm your mind, I whispered to him. Then I opened my Bible. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which most shortly come to pass. I began to read. As I did, the father settled down, pushing himself against the altar and listening intently to my reading. Page by page and chapter by chapter I read on, when things of the strangest nature transpired. And there were voices and thundering and lightning and an earthquake I'd read when I thought I heard a chorus of barely audible, high-pitched voices from outside, from the graveyard. I strained my ears to listen, but a roaring thunder struck through the air and shook the entirety of the earth. The father, however, was entirely oblivious. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. As soon as the line had left my mouth, I noticed a change had come over the chapel. The tarn's vapors had slowly made their way inside via cracks in the back door, and now wafted over the floors, becoming denser and denser, making them appear more smoke than anything. As this took place, I stared at the father wearily, but the man wasn't agitated. His eyes undisturbed, staring blankly ahead, absorbed in the gospel. Yet when I approached him and laid my hand on his shoulder, a shudder went through him and a sick smile appeared on his face. He mumbled to himself again, not at all aware of my presence. I strained and tried to listen, but once more the same high-pitched voices from outside reached my ears. The candles around us flared up, their fires growing stronger, stronger than should have been possible. Once more the shadows danced along the walls and tapestries, twisted shadows that seemed to move in their own accord. Another thunderous roar cut through the air, and with it the chapel's back door was thrown open. When I jerked around I saw a figure standing in the doorframe, a ghastly, pale figure one entirely shrouded in white. The father's sister. Alive. As she stepped into the church, the funeral gown enshrouding her slid from her body, revealing a bloated, heavy stomach, showing that she was with child. The father next to me, still in a trance, began to mumble anew. The woman was red and purple and scarlet colors. As I heard this, I couldn't help but stare at Marguerite, at her swollen purple face, and the scarlet marks on her throat. Marks not from a rope, but from hands. In that moment, the father snapped out of his trance. His voice changed from a whisper to a deafening scream. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. He boomed out, his voice reverberating, almost shaking the chapel itself. In terror, I stumbled away from the approaching she-beast. Yet she ignored me, had only eyes for the father, for her brother. When she reached him, he raised his hands again, put them around her throat once more, but only for a few fleeting moments. Then, not flinching, not backing away, he surrendered himself to her, body and soul. Behind her, the smoke was now wafting through the chapel, heavier, thicker, crawling up the walls and over the rows of seats. In between, I thought I saw strange things, small, monstrous shadows. I thought of Marguerite's bloated stomach, 
of what the father had screamed, the mother of harlots and abominations. I thought of the perpetually fresh ground of the graveyard. I shuddered as I realized what those creatures had to be. What might have been hidden out there, buried in the sodden earth. Clutching onto my Bible, I backed away from the chapel's entrance. I watched in a terror-filled trance as the she-beast threw herself at the father, driving her teeth into his throat, watched her tear the man's priestly garments off of him. In that moment, all I could do to save my sanity was to recite the very next line in the book of Revelations, the one following that which the preacher had thundered through the chapel. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints. As their fornication began, as their combined moans echoed through the chapel, I snapped out of my torpor and ran, ran from the chapel, from the vaporous, unholy ground surrounding it, still clutching the Bible the word of God in my hand, for it was the only thing which protected me from the madness. In that moment, another thunderous strike of lightning descended, right into the fissure in the bell tower, tearing the chapel in two. The flames inside spread in an instant, engulfing the entire building and all that was within. Then either side of the chapel's remains crashed into one another, and the resulting impact caused the sodden grounds to landslide, Thus, mere moments later, the wreck of the chapel, the graveyard, and even the small hill it had been on, all vanished into the dark waters of the tarn below. As I stood there, stunned by what had just transpired, unable to move, all I could do was cling to my Bible and recite one final line. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. After what I witnessed that night, I gave up on becoming a preacher. It is always those closest to God, those who are the most devout, who are closest to sin and temptation, just like Father Asher. Still, I pray every night and still I read the Bible, but I do so alone. This tale, these events, they are the reason I never entered a church again, and I was opposed to being buried at the family plot. For sin and temptation and the creatures of the pit are always, always nearby. When I was a much younger man, I used to love fishing at night. The relaxation and tranquility were unmatched after a hard week at work. But I never went again after I saw the Hell Chimp and what it did to the bridge. Cool nights with a full moon usually make for a great time to catch panfish while they feed. So I put the boat on the back of the truck and headed down to the riverbank. I was out on the river to do some nighttime fishing, and while I was there I swore I thought I saw something swinging from beam to beam under the bridge. Usually I didn't drift down that far, because of the sound of the vehicles on the bridge and the motor oil run off in the water, but despite all that I was managing to hook quite a few decent sized crappies and even a respectable catfish. I was in the middle of unhooking the first catfish of the night when I heard a low pitched howling coming from under the bridge. Tossing the catfish in the live well, I gazed up to the bridge but didn't see anything. The underside and pillars of the bridge had warning lights that flashed on and off, so the coal barges could measure the clearance during the evening hours. I tried to find the source of the howl, but the flash and dissipation of the lights kept me from being able to focus, so I decided to rebate my hook and toss the line back in. I was about to get back to baiting my fishing pole when suddenly something moved in front of one of the lights as it flashed. All I could make out were long arms and stubby legs on a circular frame. It landed on one of the pillars near the side of the bridge. As the light flashed on again and illuminated it once more, I could see it scurry from the concrete of the pillar and onto the support beam. I wiped my eyes with the ends of my fingers and tried to refocus my eyes to get a better look, but by the time I returned my vision to the support beam, there was nothing there. 
It was starting to seem like the combination of a long workday with the late fishing hours was messing with my perception a little bit. When I heard an ear-splitting noise, it sounded similar to when someone drags an old metal desk across a concrete floor. The sound bore into my eardrums like a nail, and I covered them until the long squeal seemed to go away. My ears were ringing as I saw the huge piece of debris fly from behind the support pillar and fall into the river with a thunderous splash. The waves from the impact quickly made their way toward me and began to rock my boat from side to side. The thing was trying to take the bridge down. The lights returned. Once more, the fat, chimpanzee-like creature was swinging from beam to beam and landed on another concrete support pillar. It scurried up the support beam embedded in the concrete and disappeared around the backside. The wailing, metallic sound erupted again, followed by another huge chunk of material splashing into the river. Waves around the boat intensified. There was a ringing in both my ears as the creature emerged from the darkness again, swinging from the beam and leaping at the next-to-last support pillar. The light cut off once more, but I could hear the thing scrambling up the concrete in the darkness. Flecks of concrete fell into the water below as if they were digging into it. Two more low-pitched howls sounded out of the shadows. Hey! I screamed at the thing under the bridge. Hey! I don't know what good I thought that would do, but I was hoping the damn thing would hear me and take its attention away from what it was doing to the bridge. Two more howls sounded in response, so I screamed again. Another deafening squeal of shredding metal erupted. The light flashed back on, just in time, for me to see the pickup truck-sized chunk of twisted support beam sailing through the air in the direction of me and my boat. The projectile landed five feet from me in the water, and the wave it caused nearly capsized the boat. My duffel bag, tackle box, and cooler all slipped off the side into the water. The end of the boat I was sitting on dipped down into the river and started taking on water rapidly. I scrambled to the other side of the boat to try counterbalancing it, and it settled enough to keep from taking on any more water. I heard the fourth roar of twisting metal just as the boat was starting to stabilize. The debris splashed down into the river below the bridge this time, the hell chimp seeming to have forgotten about me. The lights flashed back on and there was no terrifying creature to be seen. They flashed back off back on again, and still nothing. I stared into the periodic bursts of illumination, but still nothing emerged. It seemed like the whole ordeal might be over, when a rumbling sound began emitting from the bridge. Chunks of metal and concrete began to tumble from the underside into the flowing water below. I looked in horror as the headlights of cars dipped downward and plummeted to meet the water and the piling debris. Most of them fell directly into the river, but a few landed on crumpled pads of fallen roadway with a sickening crunch. Two of the pillars toppled into the pile of rubble in the water. The impact of the pillars crushed one of the vehicles and engaged the car horn in a permanent wail that filled up the darkness. Floating in the water around my feet, I found my flashlight. I knew the odds were poor, but I fired up the boat engine and headed towards the collapsed bridge to see if anyone in the water was still alive. As I drew near, I aimed my flashlight at the half-submerged cars and pile of bridge debris. Is anyone alive? I shouted. No response. I pushed the boat a bit further toward the wreckage and called out again. Anyone? Is anyone alive? Silence. All I could hear was the lapping of water against the debris and the occasional splash from a falling chunk of concrete. I could see headlights below the water blinking and fade away into the inky darkness of the river. Turning back to the motor, I started turning the boat around, when suddenly I heard the shuffling and shifting of stones. Hello? I yelled again. Can you hear me? Low-pitched howling filled the night air. The howl began to change into what sounded like a guttural laughing. I spun back around and aimed my flashlight at the night. For just a moment, the beam caught the beast. The thing was covered in matted black hair. I could see no eyes, but a gaping maw filled with row after row of teeth sat directly in the thing's perfectly round chest. Both arms were wiry and long, tipped with ashen white talons. It sat perched upon its knuckles and stubby legs atop a slab of concrete. 
It bellowed at me as it sprang into the air and dove into the water in front of my boat. I scrambled around the boat trying to find the 9mm handgun that I usually kept in my duffel bag, but it appeared it had slipped into the water with the rest of my gear. My head darted from side to side, looking at the rippling water for any sign of that hellish beast. There was no motion that I could detect. After a moment of frantic searching, I leaned back to use the motor to guide the boat back to shore, when there was a scraping on the bottom of the boat. Eight ash-colored talons tore through the thin hull of my vessel, and water sprouted from the puncture marks. I grabbed my life vest and stood up in the boat as it began to drift. As the boat disappeared beneath the chilly water, I kicked and panicked frantically towards the shore. My mind raced with the fact that the monstrosity was in the water somewhere below my feet, which only made me kick harder. After a few minutes of swimming, I dug myself onto the muddy bank and panted. I could already hear the distant wails of emergency vehicle sirens. When I regained some energy, I sat up and saw that I was on the opposite side of the river from my truck. It didn't matter much anyway, considering I was miles downstream. I stood up and tossed off the life jacket and looked across the river. One solitary warning light on the bridge still flickered on and off. There, on the other shore, was that damn thing. The hell chimp. Its body was turned in my direction and it just sat perched on its knuckles. The light was reflecting off its damp fur. It raised its arm and turned its talons in and out, as though it were waving at me. Two more bellowing howls and the thing turned and ran over the hill into the night. A police officer found me waiting by the road at the entrance to the crumbled bridge. He assumed my car had gone over the edge when it collapsed. I stumbled and stuttered with my words as I tried to explain to him that I had been fishing when I saw something on the bridge, how it had caused the accident, and how it had vanished into the night. I was taken to the hospital to be examined, and almost everything checked out fine. There were some scratches and bruises, but otherwise, physically, I was fine. The medical staff asked me what had happened. After trying to explain to the police officer what I had seen and his puzzled look, I decided not to repeat the tale. No one would believe me anyway. Without the age of the internet at hand, the story was relegated to one article in a local paper. The evening news out of a nearby city had a 30-second segment on it. Folks around town still mention it as well. Thanks to the police officer that found me on the side of the road sharing my incoherent tale, the folks around town include me in the story too. I'm just the crazy old man in town who drinks too much and tells wild tales. You only have to tell an unlikely story once to get a reputation. Why am I putting this out there again for everyone to ridicule and mock me? Well, I saw an article online yesterday about a bridge collapsing upriver from the one I witnessed. The beams were torn up in a way that didn't make sense to investigators. Some of the bodies from the cars that went into the river were never recovered. A few that were looked like they'd been chewed on by a damn bear. At my age, I'll be dead in a decade anyway. With my drinking, you can probably cut that estimate in half. I may as well make it known. The whole damn town thinks I'm crazy anyway. May as well toss some gas on the fire. Anyway. I don't go night fishing anymore. I don't go fishing at all. Try not to drive over bridges either when I'm sober enough to drive. That hell chimp is still out there somewhere. Maybe more than one, for all I know. It's probably just waiting for some poor guy to do a little night fishing to watch it do its evil work. It won't be me, though. I'm just going to stay home and have another drink. You probably should, too. When I first found the money tree, I couldn't believe my eyes. I had no idea yet of the pain and horror it would bring about. If I had, I would have turned around and walked straight away in the opposite direction. But I didn't, of course. It drew me in like the mirage of an oasis in the desert. It was about the size of an apple tree. But instead of growing fruit, it was growing crisp $20 bills. The green paper fluttered in the breeze, and I wandered over to it as if in a dream. 
the tree was far out in the forest where nobody ever went. But still, I felt immediately as if eyes were on me, watching me as I inspected it. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, telling me someone was spying. But when I looked around, I couldn't see anybody. There were $20 bills scattered in the grass all around the tree, stuck in the branches of the neighboring ones as well. But the other trees weren't like it. This was the only money tree around, at least as far as I could tell. My mind grappled with it, trying to decide if I was dreaming. I pinched my arm as hard as I could and felt a sharp sting of pain. Nope, not dreaming. This was real. Whatever magic had summoned this thing up from the ground, there was no sign of its origins. Only the tree itself. A miracle, as far as I could tell. I had been desperately broke lately. My wife and I had been struggling to pay the bills, and I quickly realized that this tree could solve all of our problems. There had to be thousands of dollars scattered all around, and all I had to do was collect them up from the ground. So I took off my sweatshirt and made it into a makeshift bundle, stooping down and stuffing bills inside of it as quickly as I could. After only a few moments, I heard the sound of someone's soft footsteps on the grass nearby, and looked up as they were clearing their throat. Oh, I said. I'm sorry, is this your tree? The fact that this tree should not exist at all seemed to hang in the air between us, the words left unspoken. It's nobody's tree. This tree and this forest are as much mine as they are yours. And that is to say they belong to no one. I breathed a sigh of relief. He wasn't going to try to stop me. I stooped down and began to stuff bills into the shirt bag, feeling oddly self-conscious now as he watched me. My eyes darted up at him occasionally, watching him cautiously, but the man just stood there with his arms crossed. Can I give you a piece of advice? Looking up again, I took a few seconds to actually take in the man's appearance. He was dressed in ragged, earth-colored clothing, with holes in the elbows and knees of his brown pants and long coat. His beard was overgrown and flecked with gray, full of twigs and leaves and other debris, making me think that this forest was, in fact, this man's home. He reminded me of someone, and I realized I was thinking of Radagast, the brown wizard from Lord of the Rings, who could speak to animals and could change his shape. It wasn't until much later that I realized the aptness of that comparison. Sure, I said carefully, not wanting to upset this odd, disheveled stranger. Don't pick the bills off the tree itself. The ones on the ground are fair game. You can take those home and she won't mind one bit. They fall off, they're yours. But do not take from the tree what is still growing from it. It is important that you understand this. I was already looking at the ground again, stuffing cash in my makeshift sack, only half listening, really. But I said, okay, no problem, just to get him to leave me alone. It worked. When I looked up again, he was gone. I filled up the shirt and my pants pockets, my shoes, and any other place I could think of to carry the cash. Once I got back home, I told my wife we were going to be okay that everything was finally going to be okay. But, strangely enough, it wasn't. I lost my job and had to apply for unemployment the very next day, canceling out any gains from the money tree. The layoffs were completely unexpected, and thus we were unable to prepare ourselves for the consequences. Everyone I worked with was devastated. The company had just folded overnight, and the owner decided it was too awkward and embarrassing to tell everyone. Uh, so we all went home one night thinking everything was fine, and came back the next day to find the place shuttered. A sign on the door simply read closed, and the owners wouldn't pick up the phone when we called. My pink slip came in the mail later that day, and I read it as if dreaming, thinking to myself, cowards, what a bunch of cowards they are. Why couldn't they just tell us the truth? Anyways, despite the loss of a steady paycheck and health benefits, I was slightly less upset than everyone else because 
I knew I had the money tree to go back to. The thought briefly occurred to me that I, I should share the secret with a few people from work, but I quickly decided against it. There was only so much cash to go around. Not to mention, I had begun to feel a sort of jealous ownership of the tree, despite the fact that the creepy bearded man in brown always watched me while I collected my money. Every time I went back, there was a little less cash on the ground, and the remaining bills were in worse and worse condition, being the ones I had left behind time and time again. I started to collect those dregs, ripped and soaked in mud, only barely usable. Finally, one time I went back and saw the ground only had a few bills fluttering around on it. I snatched them up quickly and grabbed a couple more that had snagged on nearby branches. But my pockets were still so empty, and there were only the bills growing on the tree remaining. I looked around and saw the man in brown was nowhere to be seen. He was gone for once, but still I felt oddly as if he were watching me, waiting for me to break his rules. What could he possibly do if I did? There was no choice. I didn't have enough money for rent or for the car insurance bill. And not to mention the overdue credit cards, cell phone bills, and utilities. My hand reached up and felt one of the bills on the tree, tugging on it ever so gently. It wouldn't come free. I pulled harder and harder, but still it wouldn't let go of it. I tried a different bill and found the same thing happened. It was firmly fastened to the tree. That was when I got desperate. I pulled out my pocket knife and flicked it from its closed position, then began to saw at the connection between tree and $20 bill. The blade sliced through quickly enough, and I inspected it in my hand. More or less normal, except for a slightly deformed edge on the corner, where the knife had raggedly cut through. It was like a pimple on the green, flat surface of the bill, still oozing a white, sap-like substance. I touched my finger to it and sniffed it, inspecting it. It didn't smell good. A bit like the smell of glue and rotting wood. And it was sticky. I couldn't get it off my finger. The sap was tenacious and got all over everything it touched. Still, I needed more money. I cut down more $20 bills and heaped them into my pockets, being careful not to touch the white sap after the first time. Still, it managed to get everywhere, and by the time I was done, I was covered in the stuff. It seemed like it was multiplying. I turned around and was startled to see a deer a little ways off in the trees watching me. Its eyes seemed to judge me, as it chewed on some unidentifiable greenery in its mouth. I needed it, I said self-consciously more to myself than to anyone else. I'm sorry. The tree stood half bare and sad looking when I glanced back at it, but I tried not to think about it too much as I stomped back through the forest towards my home. My first stop was at the ATM machine, where I would deposit the money into my account, thus allowing my bills to be paid electronically. It was practically impossible to pay bills with cash these days, after all. The funny thing was, the ATM didn't accept the bills, even though it always had before. The machines no longer used an envelope, but instead took the bills and counted them directly. As a result, with the sticky white sap leaking out from the bills, it caused the machine to jam up. I tore the bills out from the cash deposit slot and felt my face get hot as I turned around and apologized to the other bank customers waiting in line. The machine's screen was now flashing red, saying, Error please see customer service, and my card was stuck inside of it. After several hours at the bank, trying to explain why my cash looked so strange and seemed to be leaking sticky white fluid in places, they eventually accepted it with weary looks on their faces. I received an ominous warning that if the bills turned out to be fake, I would be in a lot of trouble. I drove home from the bank with a heavy heart and a guilty conscience. That night I took a long, hot shower trying desperately to get that sticky sap off my hands from all the bills. But even after an hour of scrubbing, I was still finding it in places after I dried off. The stuff was more than tenacious. It was inescapable. After a restless night's sleep, I awoke to find myself covered in the sap. It was stretching out in strands which connected my limbs to the rest of my body whenever I moved. My heart was pounding hard in my chest and my hands were shaking 
as I turned on the shower to the highest heat possible and climbed in, scalding my skin and not caring as I tried to scrub it all off. Some of the sap went down the drain, but most of it stayed on me, and I realized with increasing terror that I was now covered in the white, oozing pimple spots like the ones on the bills I had cut from the tree. They were leaking the sap all over me, and it was running over my skin in rivulets. This leaking sap was quickly drying off and hardening like magma from a volcano, turning my flesh crispy and hard in places. There was only one thing I could think to do. I ran back out to the forest as fast as my legs would carry me, racing back to the money tree. I had to talk to the man in the woods, the, the protector of the tree. He would tell me what to do. The run back to the place where the tree was became more and more difficult as I went. Sap was leaking steadily from the oozing wounds on my skin and hardening, making my flesh feel as if it were turning into stone. My fear turned to dread when I came into the clearing and found the money tree. It looked much different now than when I had first discovered it. The branches were withering and decayed, snapping off in places and looking rotten and hollow inside. Millipedes went in and out of pockmarks in the trunk, and the whole thing looked like it could collapse at any moment. The few remaining bills left upon it were yellowed and riddled with holes, unusable. A loud roar came from behind me suddenly, and I spun around to see a huge brown bear standing up on its back legs. I stared up at it and watched terrified as it started to speak in a low, rumbling voice. You were chosen as a representative of your kind. The forest gave you a test, and you have failed. Do you have anything to say for yourself? I went down on my knees with an effort, raising my hands in a prayer-like pose up to him, pleading with him. Yes, help me, please. I'm sorry, it was a mistake. He shook his head at me as he frowned no remorse or compassion to be seen on his face. Roots began spreading out from my feet, planting me there and further preventing my escape. From the white, leaking places where the white postules had been, small buds were beginning to poke out and open, bursting through my skin with agonizing, excruciating pain. Become one with nature, said the bear. I screamed, but no sound came out. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but the last few years have been wild for airline travel. It seems like not even a week can pass before a new viral video was circulating the internet, showcasing some idiot on a plane or airport screaming, shouting, or even starting fights with other passengers and flight staff for no apparent reason. I'm sure it's entertaining when you're sitting at home and come across these videos while casually scrolling through Reddit or Twitter. You might laugh, or shake your head at the stupidity and not give it a second thought. Unfortunately, this isn't an option when you're the one on the job. I can't even count the number of times I've had to call security to deal with a rowdy or straight-up violent customer in the airport over the last couple of years. Most of the time, the things that set people off are surprisingly minor and unavoidable issues. They want to board now, but it isn't their turn, so they start harassing me and my co-workers. Another passenger looked at them funny, so they get into a screaming match. A baby is crying, so the grown adult starts whining even louder. The person in front of them took the last chocolate donut with sprinkles from the airport bakery, so they start throwing punches. You would not believe the stuff I've seen. Needless to say, I got tired of it. Getting up to go to work, wondering what kind of unhinged maniac was going to make a problem for me, lost its appeal. So I started to look for a new job. A few weeks into the job search, I began to get doubtful that I would find a suitable replacement. Seeing as my only tangible skills and experience were in the airline industry, I didn't have much more than other airline jobs within realistic reach. Though I didn't have a problem with relocation, if it meant I was going to end up in another major airport, I had no interest. During one 3 a.m. job search after my long shift at the airport, running on nothing but the jittery movements from the room temperature coffee, I found a new job listing. One Pine Airport, a rural airport in the Midwest. I sat up and took another sip of coffee. 
The pictures for the place gave an idea of the size, and it looked tiny. Only a couple of runways, a single terminal, and a cute internal design reflective of the forestry that surrounded it. Perfect for me, I thought. I imagined there would not be nearly as many people to deal with. I scrolled down to the job details, and to my relief, it was for the exact same job I had already been doing. The only difference was that it required frequent night shifts. I had done plenty of night shifts before, but doing a few more of them made no difference to me. Surprisingly listed was the pay. I couldn't believe my eyes. They were offering more starting than I was being paid at the airport I had been at for over three years. Now wide awake, I eagerly uploaded my resume, filled out all the application questions, and even spent the next hour crafting an unnecessary cover letter. I headed to bed with the hopes that my days at overflowing airports might be over. The next day, as I was getting ready for work, I opened my phone to scroll through notifications and check emails. To my disbelief, I had one from the job I had applied for only hours earlier. The manager at the airport, who had posted the job, requested an interview over Zoom. I quickly replied, and we settled on a time during my lunch break the very next day. The first few hours of work breezed by, and I boarded flight after flight of passengers. I couldn't help but think about the upcoming interview. When it came time, I was nervous as hell, but my fears were diffused within the first minute. A bald, well-kept, and well-dressed man joined the meeting room and greeted me with a warm smile. He introduced himself as James. I couldn't have asked for a more friendly interviewer. He welcomed me, and after some small talk and a few questions about my relevant experience, he gave an overview of the job's details. That being the same job I already had with better pay and more frequent night shifts. No problem with me. After affirming that I knew all the details of the job, James cracked another wide, friendly smile and asked an unexpected question. When can you start? I spit the sip of coffee I had just taken back into the cup. I looked up at James and tried to find the right words, but I was unprepared. You, uh, aren't going to give me a call back later or something? Don't you have more interviews and paperwork waiting to clear and... James waved his hand dismissively at his webcam. You're the only applicant we have, and we couldn't have asked for a better one. As for the paperwork and such, we'll figure that out when we figure it out. The job is yours. Whenever you can start, that is. Uh, preferably soon. Though the feelings of shock and confusion remained, they were pushed to the side by my excitement. Throughout the remainder of our conversation, James and I reviewed our schedules and set up a start date before ending the call. I sat back in my break room chair with a sigh of disbelief and a chuckle. I am well aware that it is standard to give at least two weeks notice to your current employer, and moving across states for a job is supposed to take quite a bit of planning. But I was dying to get out of my current job. Through both eagerness and maybe a little stupidity, we settled on a day only a little over a week away. At the end of my shift that day, I let my manager know I had to be done in a week. Though she wasn't happy, she assured me it wouldn't be a problem. My final day was nothing short of horrendous. A couple had come up, demanding and screaming that I refund their tickets for no apparent reason. On top of that, they still wanted to fly. After hearing that no, they would not be able to fly for zero cost, the husband, followed by the wife, both started shouting threats. Security was quickly called to the terminal. As soon as they arrived, I checked my watch to find that my shift was over. I let out a sigh of relief and excitedly walked away. As deprived of sleep as I was, with a long and undoubtedly stressful drive ahead of me, I was still more energetic and in higher spirits than I'd been in a long time. Surprisingly, the drive went off without a hitch. I arrived earlier than expected and checked into the motel room I rented for the week, so I had time to get the move figured out. After dumping a few boxes of personal items and a suitcase of clothes into the room, I turned off the lights. I passed out as soon as my head hit the pillow. I energetically awoke that evening to prepare myself for my first shift. I quickly got dressed and started the drive in hopes of arriving plenty early. Naively, I hadn't considered how my unfamiliarity with the roads would slow me down, and after a staggering amount of wrong turns, I arrived at the airport with only minutes to spare. The airport was even smaller in person than I had imagined it to be from the pictures. 
I quickly walked through the entrance and was greeted by the small team of security. After notifying them that I was there for work, and that James had been waiting for me, they hurried me through without so much as a question. The security, the architecture, the beautiful scenery that surrounded it. Nothing about this airport could have felt more welcoming. I walked through to find a single terminal inside, devoid of any passengers, with James sitting behind a counter at the end. After a moment, he looked up, and upon making eye contact with me, his tired face lit up. I was about to apologize for my tardiness, but didn't have the chance as he rushed to show me the employee locker room where he had my new employee uniform and badge waiting inside my very own locker. He told me to get changed and to meet him outside right away. I did as he asked, and within a couple of minutes, I walked out to find him back behind the console at the counter, gathering his belongings. He noticed me approaching and glanced up, thanking me for showing up and starting so soon, as he handed me a fresh cup of coffee. He also apologized for not being able to stick around long for my shift, but he sounded sure that he wasn't all that worried. I have to be going now. I've been on duty for 17 hours. I know you're plenty familiar with our systems and software. You know what you're doing. He assured me with a pat on the back before walking out from the desk. He turned and added, It'll be a quiet night for you anyways. No flight scheduled. Just sit back, relax, and... Oh, yeah. Uh... Most importantly, I nearly forgot. He reached into his bag and pulled out a single sheet of laminated paper and held it in front of me. Give this a read as soon as you can. Go over it a few times if you need. Don't deviate from it. I took it, but before I could even get a look, I noticed James begin to walk toward the exit, along with every single one of the security guards and the cashier, who had just closed down the only shop in the airport. I then noticed that all of the scanners and metal detectors at the security gate were shut off. I started to panic. Hey, James, where's everyone going? I shouted. The first words I had managed to speak to my new boss since arriving. He stopped and turned back again. Oh, yeah. Another thing I ought to mention. Uh, everyone except whoever's working the night shift in, well, your position, takes off right around now. Uh, don't worry, security will be back around 5 a.m. You got this place to yourself. Grab a magazine from the little store in there if you get bored. Feel free to snag yourself a couple snacks, too. He began to walk away again before briefly turning and pointing at me. But before you do anything, read that list. You'll need it. I stood dumbfounded as I watched my new boss, along with all of the other airport staff, leave. I started to wrap my head around the fact that I had an empty airport to myself for ten hours, with nothing to do and no one to deal with, all while I was getting paid the highest wage I had ever earned. As much as thinking about it delighted me, I turned my attention toward the sheet of paper I almost forgot I was holding on to. James said to follow whatever list was on it, so I figured I ought to take a look. I walked behind the airport counter and sank into one of the seats behind it. I took a sip of coffee and finally took a serious look. A total of six rules were neatly spaced on the sheet. Rule 1. All lights in the airport are to stay on at all times. If one is off, or if you are to accidentally turn one off, turn it back on as soon as possible. If a light seems to be broken or is out and unable to turn back on, calmly exit the area. Report the outage to James or maintenance when possible. Do not listen to the sounds. Do not listen to the voices. Rule 2. Rule 2 pertains to rainy or stormy weather. If it is raining or storming outside, disregard rules 3, 4, and 5. They will not be a concern during these types of weather conditions. Stay inside at all times. Do not use the men's restroom and avoid going near it entirely if possible. Rule 3. Sometime between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., a young woman will walk out of the woman's restroom. She will enter the terminal and sit, occasionally getting up to walk around or change seats. Her name is Elizabeth. She will attempt to make conversation, but you must not reciprocate. You may look at her. You may give nonverbal communication, such as a head nod, you may write as a means of communication, or you may shake her hand, but do not speak to her. 
if you refuse to speak to her, Elizabeth should be gone within a few hours. If you happen to make such a mistake, go to the men's restroom and wait for her to leave. Rule 4. At around 1 or 2 in the morning, a janitor in blue coveralls will arrive at the front entrance. Crack open the door and ask for his name. If he says his name is Simon, let him in. If he gives you any name other than Simon, shut the door and lock it without another word and walk away. If the janitor is Simon, he will attend to the janitorial needs of the airport. If he asks to clean where you are standing, oblige him. Simon will not interfere with your duties otherwise. He is not hostile or dangerous. You may engage in conversation with Simon. He will leave the same way he came when he feels it is necessary. Rule 5. At around 3 a.m., you may notice that a black and red Cessna Skyhawk has landed on one of the airstrips. You will never see it land and you will never see it take off. It will just appear when you're not looking. After spotting the plane for the first time, do not look at it again. Avoid looking in its general direction if at all possible. There is a picture of the exact plane displayed inside the terminal, behind the counter. Rule 6. Later in the night, but sometime before dawn, a group of men claiming to be from TSA may arrive at the airport. They will have their own key and let themselves in. Some could be armed. Often they exhibit panic behavior. They may search through the airport, sweep room to room and ask questions. They are permitted to search anywhere in the main airport building that they please, and you may oblige to any questioning, but under no circumstances are they permitted to enter the sky bridge. They will not enter without verbal approval and they cannot harm you. After reading it over a few times, I set the laminated sheet down and leaned back further into my seat before taking a long sip of coffee, wondering what on earth I had just read. I hadn't taken James to be the imaginative type. Most of all, I hadn't taken him to be anywhere near the unprofessional type. Though, as I thought about it, it was unusual how rushed this all was, and how he left in such a hurry, leaving so few details. I began to wonder if I was being pranked. I considered that maybe this was all some sort of messed up joke or setup. I ruled that out pretty quickly. This was in fact a real airport. I had done plenty of research by the time I got here. At least a few real flights were coming in or going out each day. James had been working here for years, and I couldn't think of a reason why he would jeopardize his job or reputation just to get a scare out of me. After chuckling to myself at the absurdity of the situation, I decided to indulge and see what would happen. Maybe it was a test for me as a new employee. Maybe James wanted to see if I could follow orders. After glancing at the list once more and realizing the impact Rule 2 had on the number of things I would have to keep track of, I brought up my phone to check the forecast. Clear skies. Not a chance for rain or storms all night. Great, I thought to myself. I had to watch out for these Elizabeth and Simon characters to show up and I suppose not be on the lookout for a random plane to appear on the runway. I stood up and grabbed my coffee, walking to the glass panes. I took another sip from my cup while admiring the lit runways along the airfield. It sure was a pretty nice sight. As I was raising my cup to finish what was left, I began to hear the click of shoes on the floor somewhere behind me. Startled, I spun around abruptly, dropping my cup and spilling the remainder of the coffee in the process. At the other end of the terminal seating stood a young woman, around her mid-twenties in my estimation. She was holding two large leather suitcases in each hand, and had an old-fashioned sense of style with a skirt and heels. Most surprising was her stunning beauty and welcoming smile. Oh, sorry dear, I didn't mean to scare you, she expressed with a sincere tone. I opened my mouth, ready to assure her that everything was fine, but I stopped myself. I recalled the list. At this point, I was certain that she was here at James' request, a paid actor determined to make me break the rules. I was more determined not to. Instead, I simply fixed my posture, straightened my uniform, and looked back with a smile. She walked to the counter where she placed her leather suitcase on the ground before closing the distance between us. Looks like we've got this fabulous airport all to ourselves. I'm Elizabeth. 
she said, reaching out her hand. I shook it, but she didn't seem quite satisfied. And your name? I continued to smile and lock eye contact. Her grin grew for a moment before she remarked, You don't seem to be much of a talkative one. And with that, she turned and started to walk away. I returned to my seat behind the counter, watching her closely as I did. Elizabeth proceeded to the unattended airport shop, and after a couple of minutes of looking over magazine covers and occasionally taking a peek inside, she returned carrying a small stack of reading material. She approached my counter before placing a National Geographic magazine in front of me. I figured you might like this one. Enjoy, she said, winking before settling on a seat in the first row of the terminal, straight across from where I'd been sitting. Remarkably, her intuition was spot on. I may have lived in cities all my life, but I loved nature, despite how little of it I had gotten to see. National Geographic was a favorite of mine, one I had been familiar with and enjoyed on work breaks from time to time. Rarely was I given this long to be able to read. I was almost tempted to break the rule and thank her for her rather thoughtful act. Though I didn't. I stuck to the rule. The next couple of hours were uneventful. Elizabeth and I read through our magazines, occasionally looking up at each other to exchange glances and smiles. Within that time, she had attempted to get me to talk at least a half dozen more times. I almost gave in when she asked me if I wanted another magazine. At a little past 1.30, I could hear a knock at the front entrance. Elizabeth and I both looked before she remarked, Oh, that must be the nice cleaner man, with a giggle before returning to her magazine. I walked over to the front doors, and sure enough, there stood a man around his mid-thirties, sporting a blue janitor suit, waiting patiently at the door. I unlocked the door and opened it. As he took a stride to enter, I remembered the most important detail from Rule 4. I closed the door halfway and sternly commanded, Wait. The man looked up at me with a surprised look. What is your name? The man stared back at me as an innocent smile formed on his face. I'm Simon. Uh, the janitor here. Uh, did James tell you I was coming in tonight? I stood there for a moment, thinking over the rule, before nodding my head and opening the door once again to let him in. Once inside, Simon walked with purpose to the janitor's closet, which was positioned near the men's restroom. I followed him somewhat suspiciously for the next few minutes as he began to clean, but I eased up once I got the feeling that he was just the janitor around here, and that James made up the whole ask-for-his-name thing to make into one of his rules. I returned to my counter in the terminal and continued to read. Occasionally, Simon would pass by, off to do his duties in some part of the airport, or Elizabeth would stand up to look at the various pictures and paintings on display in the terminal. A good half an hour of this would go on before Simon approached the terminal counter with his mop in hand. He seemed to be eyeing up the two leather suitcases Elizabeth had set there. Assuming he wanted to clean where they were, I got up to move them. I grabbed each one by the handle, but failed to lift them off the ground. Confused, I stepped back to see they were stuck on something. They were not. Just two suitcases, left right where Elizabeth had set them. I tried to lift just one. Again, I failed. I tried both hands, putting my back and legs into it with all that I had. They wouldn't budge. I looked back up at Simon, who nodded his head in Elizabeth's direction. I turned to look at Elizabeth, who, after noticing my stare and my apparent inability to move her luggage, smiled and stood up. Let me get that for you, she insisted. With ease, she lifted both leather suitcases and moved them closer to her seat before lowering them, this time letting them drop a few inches. When they hit the ground, a boom echoed through the airport, and I flinched in surprise. I looked back at Simon, who hadn't seemed shocked at all. He just continued to mop. I slowly made my way back to my seat, not taking an eye off Elizabeth for one second as I did. After a few minutes, she looked back up from her magazine, noticed my stare, and returned to her reading with a grin. She seemed to find my shock amusing. Eventually, Simon noticed my surprise as well. He paused his mopping and approached me before raising his head. 
I know, I know. Stick to the rules. Everything will be fine. Trust me. He stated quietly. I nodded my head in response. Simon went back to his cleaning. A few minutes passed before Elizabeth had something new to say. What a remarkable aircraft, she exclaimed, looking out the glass panes facing the runway. I followed her gaze to the lone, black and red airplane positioned on the runway. I turned around, looking at the picture displayed behind me. It certainly looked like a match. I turned back to the window and felt my heart sink. A silhouette of a person now stood next to the plane, facing the airport and the windows of the terminal. Stop looking at it, Simon sternly muttered from behind me. I looked back at Simon, who quickly cowered, seemingly ashamed to have raised his voice at me, but I was grateful he had. I read over Rule 5 again, specifically where it stated to not look at the plane twice. I murmured insults at myself under my breath, but they didn't have much room between my now heavy, frantic breathing. My eyes darted through the other rules. I chose to focus on that sheet of paper. At least it was something to look at other than that plane outside. This went on for a good ten minutes or so, and my breathing started to calm down. I had begun to pray in my head that whoever and whatever that was would go away when Elizabeth suddenly approached my counter. I snapped my head up in a jittery movement to make eye contact with her. I'm going to get some more reading material. Want another one of those? She asked, reaching a hand out to my National Geographic magazine. I looked up and nodded, forcing a smile. As she moved away, my gaze didn't. And once again, I found myself looking at the plane on the runway. The silhouette now standing hundreds of feet away from the plane, even closer to the building and still staring in my direction. Chills ran up my spine as I snapped my gaze back to my desk. I began to shake with fear, and the manic breathing returned. Moments later, Elizabeth returned and placed a new magazine on the counter, before running a hand over my shoulder, seemingly to comfort me. Simon then put his hand on my back. He'll be gone soon, and so will the plane. Just don't look at it again he assured me. Mind if I clean here? He then asked. I got up and walked to the end of the counter, watching Simon thoroughly clean the floor before I looked up and let out a soft, Thank you. He nodded and smiled back. What was that? Elizabeth asked. I turned towards her. Oh, I was just thanking Simon for... My error occurred to me before I could finish speaking. My eyes locked on Elizabeth as she stood up from her seat and her smile faded. Her eyes and nose began to bleed profusely as she started to sob, lightly at first, then hysterically. She let out a bellowing screech, a mix of pain and anger. She picked up one of her suitcases and hurled it at me. I barely dodged the ridiculously heavy object before it crashed into the wall behind me. Luckily I was quick thinking this time and made a run for the men's restroom recalling Rule 3. She chased after me, but I slammed the door shut in her face and locked it. Elizabeth pounded on the door with furious anger a few times, but gave up quickly. So that's how you dance, is it, love? I can play that game. She snickered before flipping a light switch outside the bathroom. The clicking of her shoes faded away. A few minutes of silence passed before laughter started to become audible from the other side of the door. One voice grew to two, Two voices grew to three. Three grew to ten. While others continued their now hysterical laughing, some began to scream. I crumpled to the floor, covering my ears as the voices went on, only stopped by another flip of the switch. Light beamed through the bottom of the door. It's over now. She's gone. And so is the plane. I've got to be getting out of here soon, too. Simon's calm and friendly voice called out. I reluctantly exited the bathroom and followed him back to the counter, where he had prepared another coffee for me. I wish I could have done more there, but you'll come to find out that when Elizabeth gets angry, you just gotta let her do her thing. I looked up at him, still with my distraught face, at a loss for words. 
Over the next few minutes, Simon finished clearing Elizabeth's blood from the floor before putting everything back into the janitor's closet. He looked down at his watch. I better get out of here. Good luck with the rest of your night. I hope I'll be seeing you soon, he said, letting out a sigh as he again looked at me in pity. I think he knew how shaken up I was. It was like he had seen people in my position before. Something told me he doesn't have a choice on when he leaves. After I watched him exit the door, I returned to my seat behind the counter. I began to feel alone and afraid, but the loneliness wouldn't last, at least. Only minutes after Simon left, the door swung open, and men in tactical gear, most of which had their faces covered in masks and goggles, rushed through the door. I sprang back up from my seat and watched as they did, with not much else I could do. They swept room to room, checking every nook and cranny at gunpoint, ignoring my existence at first. As they cleared the entire building, the twenty or so armed men made their way to the terminal seating area. A lone man in a suit, whom I had not noticed before, made his way to the front of the group. I'm with TSA. I'm going to need you to answer a few questions for me, he demanded. I nodded in affirmation. How many individuals have you seen in this airport since the security team left the building? Besides myself? Two inside, one outside, I answered confidently. Was the individual outside next to a black and red Cessna Skyhawk? Yes, I again responded confidently. The man in the suit nodded and paused for a moment before making another demand. We are going to need to search the air bridge. I glanced back at the sheet of rules on the counter, making sure I had read it right before. I took a step forward and straightened my uniform. No, I replied. The man in the suit looked irritated. If you do not step aside and give us permission to search, I'm afraid I'll have to detain you. Already tired and worn out, I wasn't going to break the last rule. I decided to give a not-so-smart remark to the man in the suit. Looking a little well-armed for TSA, wouldn't you agree? He ignored my comment. Last chance, step aside. No. Again, irritated by my response, the man in the suit turned to his right and raised his chin to give a signal. Gunshots rang out and I collapsed to the floor. I felt as though my life left my body before it all faded to black. The next thing I remembered was the feeling of my hand gripping a water bottle. Then came James's voice. I see you made it through the first night intact. Looks like you got to meet Simon. He's a nice guy, you'll get to like him. And Elizabeth, she's... well, she's something else, isn't she? I opened my eyes and looked up at James. Am I dead? I asked in a raspy voice. James chuckled in return. No, no, you did great. You're fine. It does, however, look like you might have been a little assertive to our undead TSA Special Force wannabes. I would recommend sticking with the less aggressive tone and word choices. Maybe I ought to edit that into the rule sheet. In any case, they can't hurt you, but they can still get a jump out of you, as you saw. Once again, I was at a loss for words. I slowly made my way back to my feet from the ground and looked at the sunrise over the airfield. James held out an envelope for me. I opened it, revealing a stack of crisp $100 bills. A little bonus for your first night. It sure is a lot to go through for the first time, but I promise you get used to it all. I turned to James with an angry look and finally spoke up. What the hell is wrong with you? What makes you think it's okay to put someone through this without any warning? I'm done. Keep your damn money. I'm going to go call the cops. I started to walk towards the exit when James stepped in front of me. Look, I know it isn't fair for you, but it wasn't fair for me either. It wasn't fair for any of us. It's not okay, I know. But what do you expect me to do? Someone needs to be here for the night shift. You wouldn't believe any of this if I told you ahead of time. You would have thought I was some sort of nut job, and the police will think the same if you tell them. I needed you to see it for yourself. James was starting to get worked up and stopped to breathe before continuing. This money is yours. No strings attached. You're free to leave now and never come back. There will be no shame in it. I also started to calm down, but I couldn't bring myself to look James in the eye yet. If you choose to stay, I'll see you in my office to finish up your paperwork. 
and with that, James walked away. Facing the front of the airport, I watched the first few passengers of the day come through the entrance. I just stood there for a few minutes. Whether I was ready for this job or not, I knew right then I sure as hell wasn't going to go back to another overcrowded city airport. I turned and headed for James' office. The woman entered my office uninvited. Maggie was sick at home, or she would have sent her on her way. But then again, I got the feeling even Maggie couldn't have refused this woman. She had a look of determination in her icy blue eyes. Her short, ash-blonde hair was swept up to the side stylishly, and she carried an oversized bag with her. Immediately, I recognized what she was. I'd seen enough of her kind in my time. A pharmaceutical rep. Dr. Baum, she said, reaching out her hand. I took it and gave it a polite shake. I'm Lisa from Rendex Pharmaceuticals. We've been trying to reach you by telephone, but never quite managed to connect. Probably because my secretary has been doing her job, I thought to myself. She always screened those sorts of calls. I had no interest in becoming a shill for a drug company. My apologies, I said tersely. What can I do for you? She set her large black bag on the reception counter, next to where we were standing, and began to pull out sample packets and brochures. The phone began to ring loudly at the desk. I wanted to answer it, but the woman had already begun her pitch. Well, that's just it, Dr. Baum. It's not about what you can do for us, but what we can do for your patients. Here we go, I thought. She opened up a brochure and began to show me details from inside its glossy pages. Speaking persuasively enough that I listened instead of immediately sending her on her way, as I usually did. She was an extremely good saleswoman. Our newest drug, Smilotrex, has just been accepted for approval by the FDA. It's an absolute game-changer. Effective for depression, anxiety, even thoughts of self-harm can be allayed by its formula. This is the next generation we're talking about. This drug, by itself, is going to completely replace SSRIs and benzos in the next few years. All the benefits, without the harmful side effects and dependencies. Not only that, but instead of taking months to begin working, as is the case with most SSRIs, Smilotrex begins its effects almost immediately. Those are some very bold claims. So you can see why we've been trying so hard to reach you. To talk to you about it, she said with an undeterred smile. I picked up one of the sample boxes and examined it. The packaging looked like any other drug. A pale purple color with yellow butterflies all over it. The company's brand name stamped upon it in bold letters. Rendex Pharmaceuticals? How come I've never heard of you guys? We're a German company, new to North America, but we're going to make a big splash in the Western markets. I'd tell you to start investing now, but I'm sure you don't play the stock market. No, I don't. And I don't usually speak to pharmaceutical reps either, if I'm being entirely honest. But if even half your claims are true... They're all true, she replied, her teeth firmly fixed in that unstoppable grin. Leave the sample packets. I'll do some research and think about it. How's that? She stuck out her hand for another shake, and I took it reluctantly. That's all I can ask for, Doctor. I won't take up any more of your time. I'm sure you're very busy. Packing up her bag, she thanked me and left, the broad smile still plastered on her face. It was disarming, and I couldn't help but smile back at her as she walked out, saying goodbye. I vowed to do some research of my own before giving out the sample packages to anyone. So that night, I took a box home with a brochure and decided I would do a few hours of reading, trying to find out exactly what the benefits and side effects of Smilotrex would be. Don't ask what got into my head. Why I ended up taking the pills, especially when I didn't even know the first thing about the company or the product. I wouldn't say I'm depressed, per se, but I've slipped into a bit of a rut since my father died a couple years back. Every day feels the same, 
The old pleasures of life don't bring the same enjoyment. People who know me well say I don't laugh or joke around as much as I used to. I wasn't pining for happiness, I was just curious. Still, I should have known better than to try an untested drug given to me by some stranger. Websites can be faked. They can be easily thrown up and plastered with images and information that is utterly false and misleading. It takes time for those sorts of websites to get taken down. And all it took was a visit to three or four of those fake websites provided by the pharmaceutical rep, conjured up to look real, and I was impressed. On the Smilotrex company website was a promotional video. I remember that much. But I don't remember what happened in it or why I felt so persuaded after watching it. But suddenly, I really wanted to try the drug for myself. To feel its amazing benefits. For some reason I'll never understand, I took out the sample packet. Right after watching the video on the Smile Attracts company website. I examined the little round pill and saw there was a symbol etched on it that looked druidic and evil. Swallowing the pill dry, I couldn't help but wonder why I had just done that. My phone began to ring and I picked it up to hear Maggie, my secretary, on the other end. I blinked my eyes and saw it was morning outside, and yet I had no memory of falling asleep, or of anything after taking the pill. Hello, Dr. Baum. Oh, hi, Maggie, I said, smiling wide at the sound of her voice. How are you feeling? I hope you're doing much better. I'm feeling much better, actually. Um, I'll be back in today. That's great news! The place isn't the same without you. She paused. Are you okay, Dr. Baum? You sound different. I'm great, Maggie. Actually, I feel better than ever. I had the best night's sleep of my life last night. I don't remember a thing. Oh. Okay, I guess that's good. Well, I'll, I'll see you at the clinic in an hour or so. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Maggie. She hung up and I got out of bed to get myself ready for work. There was a full slate of appointments booked for the morning, but the afternoon was mostly left open for walk-ins and emergencies. It would be nice to have Maggie back in, since she took a bit of the weight off my shoulders. Her job was to check patients in, take their weights and vital signs, as well as faxing paperwork and answering phones. It was hard to do all by myself, especially since our fax machine was about a decade old and malfunctioned regularly. Maggie knew how to tame the ancient beast, though. As I brushed my teeth, I couldn't help but think how long it had been since I felt so good. Sure, the lapse in memory was slightly alarming, but as I looked at my face in the mirror, I couldn't help but grin wider, thinking about how nice it felt just to be alive. My skin was tingling with anticipation for the day, and for all the things it held in store. It felt like wonderful little bugs crawling all over me, burrowing into my flesh. How delightful! When I arrived at work, my cheeks were beginning to hurt from smiling so much. It was like I couldn't stop. No. Not that. Really, I didn't want to. The world was just so bright and blue and wonderful. It made me want to laugh with joy. And so I did. Then, after that, I began to giggle. As I entered my office and said good morning to Maggie, I broke into a titter. Then a full-blown belly laugh. What's so funny, Dr. Baum? She asked nervously. I couldn't even speak to answer her. I just went into my office and hung up my coat. Then sat down in front of my computer, slapping my knee and guffawing. Tears were streaming down my face as I continued chuckling all the way up until my first appointment. The patient could be heard coming into the waiting room, and I held my hands to my mouth like a child in church to keep the laughter in. I listened as Maggie checked the man in and took his weight on the old rickety scale. As she brought him into the exam room, I tried to suppress my laughter, which was self-sustaining at this point. No matter how much I tried to think of sad things to stop myself from giggling, it continued. I was vaguely beginning to get worried that I couldn't stop it. Finally, I managed to focus and get it under control. 
Breathing deeply, I stood up and started walking into the room where the patient was waiting for me. I pushed open the door and entered, saying good morning to the man who was sitting on the steel examination table wearing nothing but his underwear. He was very, very hairy. Sitting down, I looked at the laptop screen and brought up his appointment information. Patient name, Harold Harry Ball, age 69. I thought about this for a moment before bursting into laughter again. The man held up his arms over his naked chest as it flushed red to match his face. For a few moments he looked embarrassed, but then that expression changed to one of worry. Dr. Baum, are you all right? For some reason, I couldn't stop laughing to answer him. He walked out of the appointment and said he wouldn't come back, that there was something wrong with me. The rest of the day, I couldn't stop laughing, even after Maggie left. She quit after I refused to speak with her rationally, saying that when I got my wits together, I should call her to talk and to apologize. I shut down the office, and for the rest of the week, the laughter continued. Then, for week after week after that, until I couldn't even leave my bedroom. The pain in my diaphragm was so excruciating, the growing wounds on my face so terrifying to passerby. It got worse and worse. Have you ever gotten the giggles so bad that your face starts to hurt? Imagine getting the giggles for a month, being unable to stop laughing for an entire four-week period, and it still isn't letting up. I still can't stop smiling, no matter how hard I try. My face hurts so badly I want to scream, but I can't do anything but continue chuckling like a broken Elmo toy. They had to admit me to a hospital as my face began to split and crack around my mouth and eyes. Bleeding wounds growing from the laugh lines which turned into weeping sores. Who knows when this will stop? When it will finally be out of my system is anyone's guess. The company's videos certainly aren't any help. Now that they've been wiped from the internet. Vanished as if they never even existed. I just hope that I can be free of this toxic shit one day soon. So let this be a warning to any doctors out there. If you see Lisa from Rendex Pharmaceuticals enter your office, don't take the sample boxes. Don't watch the videos or read the brochures. Who knows what page or what image it is that will flip the switch in your mind and make you want to take the little pill she offers. Grinning and promising happiness. I guarantee you, it isn't worth it. I've been living with Marielle for four years. To say she's my girlfriend is not enough. We're on the edge of getting engaged and making it official, but the pandemic put a pin in our plans. We found lots of new things to do in that time. We agreed early on to get our own hobbies, so we wouldn't go crazy being in each other's faces all the time during lockdown. I started taking online keyboard lessons and drawing, while she got back to her childhood love, online gaming. We both started a diary to physically see what we're doing from day to day, and to remind us that we're progressing. Marielle became part of a raiding guild in a large online MMO. She's a natural organizer, and second in command to the guild leader called Password. They all have these ridiculous usernames, and hearing her talk to them over Discord sounds like a cheap spy movie. There's Password, Killer, Alder, and a whole bunch of others. My girlfriend just calls herself Empty. She says it's a reference to her carefree nature, that she is empty of worry. Yesterday I woke up to find her gone. She took the car, every dollar out of our joint account, and a bag of clothes. I didn't hear the car as it left the driveway. She's been acting weird, keeping more to herself than usual. She's been having trouble with her phone and computer. 
But most of the time we spent together, she's been her usual loving self. I had no idea. She left an open document on her computer. And I want to see if anyone can make sense of this. It is an excerpt of her diary. Marielle, if you're hearing this, please come back. 2119 CDT, GMT-5, April 6th, 2021. First off, do not say the cited phrase on video. I'll mark it in cursive. If you do, it'll be replaced with the same video that mine was. It's a rule. I was uploading the in-game footage from our monthly guild meeting when something strange happened. The video was immediately taken down. I got a notice about part of my video containing copyrighted footage, and the entire video was claimed. I first thought it was a bot, as the claimant was just a long series of letters and numbers seemingly random. PA01ALALKIOSO4MA08. There was a part of my video that had been marked containing the copyrighted footage, and I just laughed when I saw it. It's a short segment where Password is recounting the guild members who've contributed to the monthly donation box in March. It goes, Password, 01, Alder, Alder, Killer, Austin, 04, Markdown, 08. This meant Password had given $10, Alder had given $40 twice, Killer and Austin gave $40 each, Markdown gave $80 in one sum at the end of the month. I can't stress this enough. You shouldn't say those words on YouTube. The first thing I noticed about this claim was the claimant itself. The name is basically code for what password read aloud in the video. PA01, meaning password01, for example. Take a second look at it. The other thing I noticed was that the video was taken down, but there was no way to dispute the claim. There's nothing but a big blue submit button, and I pressed it. Maybe I shouldn't have. Instantly the video turned unlisted, and the part where Password is reading was replaced with a weird video clip. It's this odd inverted black and white clip of some kind of black background with a hint of cables. It's a mess. The text unauthorized and a series of numbers and letters run in the top of the corner. There's a monotone sound blaring. In the middle of the video it jump cuts to a face holding up a finger to its lips, as if shushing the viewer. The figure has part of a face, part of a torso, and a hand, that's all. We can't see any eyes, cheeks, hair, nothing. Anonymous. The clip plays and then the video resumes. I showed it to my guildmates, and they had no idea what was going on. I'm looking into this in the morning. We've got a raid tonight. Here's the next entry. 821 CDT, GMT-5. April 7th, 2021. The numbers and letters correspond with the username of the claimant, which in turn is short for the phrase we accidentally said in the video. I think it might be some sort of key phrase embedded into the content ID system. 8 seconds, 15 hundredths. The original clip was just past 9 seconds, so there is a difference. It recognizes the phrase, takes your video down, and replaces your clip with something that censors the code if you submit. It seems fine in writing, though. Maybe it changes if I upload it somewhere a content recognition software is running. Anyways, I've emailed YouTube support about it. 1248 CDT, GMT-5, April 15th, 2021. Three emails, no response. We've taken out the code part of the video and re-uploaded it. No problem. 2206 CDT, GMT-5, April 16th, 2021. I got a call just now. It was just a monotone noise. I recognized it from the video. The caller ID just said, Submit. Like the little blue button I clicked on YouTube. I'm pretty sure I accidentally bugged something in the algorithm. I'm going to do an experiment. 0406 CDT. GMT-5, April 17th, 2021. I've been up all night. I made a video on my phone with me just reading the keywords and uploaded it to Twitter. The tweet just got deleted. I got a DM from a user with the same name as the YouTube claimant, with just the word UNAUTHORIZED in all caps. 
I've tried Instagram and TikTok, and it all just gets taken down. It only seems to be YouTube where it can't just be deleted and is instead replaced and made private. Searching for the username gives literally no Google search results. Not even one. 0606 CDT. GMT-5. April 17th, 2021. Got a text from an unknown number. It just said, unauthorized. 0631. CDT, GMT-5, April 17th, 2021. Turn my phone off. I keep getting spammed by text messages, all saying unauthorized. 1251 CDT, GMT-5, April 17th, 2021. I turned on my phone and got another call from Submit. This time I tried saying the words in the monotone. The, the tone just stopped. I sat there quiet. Six seconds passed, then I heard this robotic voice say, Unauthorized. I think the system believes I'm trying to access something I'm not supposed to get into. Next time, I'll try saying something else. 1812 CDT, GMT-5, April 21st, 2021. It's been quiet for a couple days, but I got another call tonight. This time I said, Submit. The monotone disappeared, then the voice responded, Confirm. I just repeated, Submit. Then the weirdest thing happened. It sounded like someone trying to pick up the phone on the other end, but there was a struggle. I could hear a no, but the call was cut short. A friend of mine is looking into the claimant on YouTube. Apparently there's some sort of invite-only forum for people who specialize in internet sleuthing, and looking up the real person behind certain usernames. 2356 CDT, GMT-5, April 26th, 2021. No response yet. Two guys on the opposite team came up to me in the battlegrounds and begged me to kill them. Over and over. My guildies laughed their asses off, but I found it kind of weird. It wasn't just trolling, it seemed off. 0941 CDT, GMT-5, May 4th. 2021. There was a hit on the username. There was a password leak from a game developer back in 2004 where someone had that username. There's also a password, Zamarkand, with every vowel replaced with a 6. I typed it out on my phone as a reminder to myself and it, it just went black. Complete factory reset as soon as I put in the last D in the password. What the fuck? 1412 CDT, GMT-5, May 4th, 2021. I got my phone to work, and as soon as it started up, I got called again. I started the recording. This time I said the username and then the password in order. The voice said confirm, and I actually got a ringing noise as if calling someone. The other end picked up, but they were quiet. I tried explaining that this was a mistake and that whoever they were, I just didn't want anything to do with them. Blameless, they said. You're blameless. It was a man's voice. Old, hoarse throat. Yes, I am, I responded. It's all a mistake. The voice screamed out blameless so loud that my phone just fried its own loudspeakers. My ears were ringing for minutes. My phone is beyond saving at this point. I think the battery snapped in half. Needless to say, the recording was lost. 1806 CDT, GMT-5, May 16th, 2021. Someone pointed at me in the grocery store today. Young guy, late teens, glasses. He just pointed at me and said, blameless. He had this weird, blank stare. He lives around here. I've seen him before. I just got out of there. It freaked me out. 2220 CDT, GMT-5, May 16th, 2021. People are stalking me in-game. They're sending me private messages, asking me to kill them. Over and over, begging and pleading. They keep calling me blameless. My guildies aren't laughing about it anymore. 
0301 CDT GMT minus 5 May 16th 2021 Someone joined our Discord just screaming and crying. They got muted and banned. They tried joining under a different name, but our moderators didn't let them through. Uh, we put a temporary hold on new members. 0840 CDT. GMT minus 5. May 17th, 2021. Things are getting out of hand. I haven't slept, but I'm not tired. I'm off the computer. Carl called me blameless in his sleep. He just flipped over, looked at me, and murmured it. I don't think he was even awake. Why am I not tired? No phone, no computer, nothing. I'm off grid. Well, except for the pad I'm writing this on. 0856 CDT. GMT minus 5. May 17th, 2021. Blameless, blameless, blameless. How the F blameless? Huck are the blameless. Hey, doing this, I'm not blameless. To the internet, listless. 1201 CDT. GMT minus 5. May 26th, 2021. I'm on Carl's computer. It's Wednesday. I don't sleep anymore. I don't get tired. I wake for nine days. Blameless is not something you are. It is like a title. They follow the title, not the person. Carl keeps saying blameless in his sleep. Someone left a gun on the hood of my car. I thought about calling the police, but I just left it on the sidewalk. I took a walk in the woods today, and someone was screaming off the path. They were screaming that I had to kill them. I heard running. There were three of them. I got away. I hid in the bushes while they were crying. Submit was not just a button. It is a choice you do. I was an idiot who chose to submit. I am blameless now. 0541 CDT. GMT minus 5. June 6th, 2021. I killed for the first time today. And it made the rest shut up for a while. They kind of forced me, but not really. They, they put a gun in my hand, but I just wanted them to fucking stop screaming. It was a sweet release. My ears stopped ringing. I even got a bit tired. I might sleep tonight. My stomach churned. I wanted to eat them. Just delete and remove everything about them. They chose to submit too, but they are not the blameless. 0336 CDT. GMT minus 5. June 12th, 2021. 18 of them and there are more coming. We were in a clearing and they were waiting for me. There were white vans parked nearby, but I didn't care who watched. I just started killing. I wanted the begging to stop, the sounds to stop, the screaming. The silence feels like being reconnected to the might of God. I miss just hearing nothing. I ate so much. 0516 CDT, GMT minus 5, June 18th, 2021. Carl said it in his sleep. My first instinct was to kill him, to eat. But I didn't. This is all so fucking absurd. I'm collecting my thoughts. I agreed to something I didn't know what it was. There was something that changed in me. I was marked. Some kind of dormant system picked up my accidental code and it woke up. It woke up in me, a target. Carl, when you read this, I've left town. I don't want to hurt more people. I'm going into the woods where most people can't find me. I don't know what other changes there will be. I barely eat. I don't sleep. My skin is losing color and there are blotches in my throat that make me sound weird. Hoarse throat. I just keep waiting to hear someone ask me to kill them. It's like a phantom voice just out of reach. They just trigger something in me, and I go into this... this rage. Just thinking about it makes me so fucking mad. I keep getting these thoughts that aren't mine. A spot in the ocean. A woman on the edge of a cove holding my hand to the braying sound of desperate worshippers. Black rain rising from the earth, daintily falling back into the clouds. 
lightning frozen in the sky like bursting veins, breathing boils of flesh and tendons willingly given. I'm not in love with you anymore, Carl. I love the cove and the hatchet man. I love me. I'm blameless. I have to leave to save you. I don't even want to anymore, but I've already committed to doing so. If I were to change my mind now, I'd do terrible things to you. But I've already decided. I've already promised myself I wouldn't change my mind, no matter what. Even if it would mean you staying with me forever. Even if it would mean you standing by my side at the edge of the cove. Love eternal. Even if it meant us submitting, I won't do it. I'll leave you to a tragic life not knowing what God means because I promised myself I would, and I'm so fucking sorry. I want you to find me. I want you to submit. I also know I do not want to want this, but I do. Please don't. The document had about 180 pages after this just filled with the word blameless, repeated over and over. I've tried cleaning it up so I could post it, but some of what she's saying is just complete nonsense. I don't believe in internet voodoo, and I don't know what the online community knows. I think she got involved with something. I've tried talking to her guildmates, but they haven't heard anything from her for over a month. She has no history of mental illness in her family. We've called the police and we're tracking the car, but so far we've got nothing. I've tried doing what she mentioned, to upload a video of the key phrase. The same thing still happens. It gets replaced with the clip she linked. That's the thing, and I've submitted it to the police. They have no idea what to make of it, but they believe it might be some kind of cult. I don't even know what to think anymore. What to feel. I miss her so much, and to think she's been through something so huge on her own just churns my stomach. Why wouldn't she tell me? Marielle is not a bad person. She doesn't do what this text says she does. She, she doesn't believe in ghosts and goblins. She's a gardener, not a murderer. Her phone cover has a smiling blue sunflower on it. If you're reading this... Please come back. Please seek help. Please don't leave it like this. It was just before recess when Matt asked me to hold his egg. We were doing a school project where the goal was to keep an egg safe for an entire week. As if it were your own baby. If you dropped your egg and broke it, you got an F. Mr. Geis had signed all the eggs with a sharpie, so there was no chance of cheating. Everyone in class had devised a plan to keep their prized egg safe for the week, and Matt was no exception. He was using a white and red thermos lined with tissue paper inside. It looked secure, and I wasn't worried about breaking it. In fact, it looked safer than mine, and I was starting to consider changing my design. Maybe because I was distracted thinking about my own egg container device, I didn't have a firm enough grip on Matt's thermos. When I got bumped from behind by another kid, I fumbled it. The whole contraption went flying and landed right in front of the teacher's desk. Mr. Geis saw the egg jump from its thermos, and a second later it went splat, right on the floor in front of his desk. Jason, was that your egg? He demanded, leaping up from his chair. Mr. Geis had always hated me. I had him in the sixth grade after he replaced the best teacher in school at the last minute. Then, in the eighth grade, he surprised me again by replacing the second best teacher in school and taking over for his class, which I was entering. The first day, I couldn't believe it, seeing Mr. Geis sitting behind the desk where Mr. L was supposed to be. Mr. L had been my older brother's favorite teacher ever. Three years prior, I'd heard all the stories of how he'd taken his students on field trips every month and entertained them with his comedic lectures, using characters and voices and props that captivated even the most unteachable students. Mr. Geis, by contract, was a phys ed major, who thought gym class was superior to everything, 
and barely understood math or science. He was highly favored among the jocks and bullies, and despised by the geeks and nerds like myself. That first day of eighth grade, Mr. Geis was sitting up front, and he must have seen the disappointed look on my face, because he scowled at me and yelled at me to take my seat. It was as if he had read my mind, and knew I hated him, and that I was disappointed he was my teacher again. For almost two full years, I'd suffered under Mr. Geis. He was mean, rude, and somehow managed to become friends with all of the bullies in school who regularly beat me up during recess. One of those bullies was Matt, whose egg I had just broken. No, Mr. Geis, I said, showing him my egg, safe and sound. That was Matt's. I turned around and looked at Matt, then wished I hadn't. Sorry, I mumbled under my breath. The teacher's face went a shade redder. Matt was his favorite student. Matt was the quarterback on the football team which Mr. Geis coached. And Matt, despite being the worst student in class, was adored by Mr. Geis. The teacher's eyes shifted, and I saw he was looking at Matt sympathetically. Matt, who was standing behind me, vibrating with rage. The freckles on his cheeks became harder to see as his entire face went crimson. Despite the fact that I knew he wanted to fail me, a precedent had already been set, and everyone knew what had to happen next. Unless that was a decoy, you get an F, Matt. Mr. Geist said, sitting back down and marking something in his notebook with a red pen. Next time, pick somebody smarter to hold your baby. Somehow that stung worse than anything yet. It didn't take long for Matt to find me during recess. His tall, lanky, hyena-voiced friend Chris accompanied him as they held me up against a wall and began to lay a beating on me. It didn't help that Matt now had both hands free, while I had to hold on to my precious egg for dear life. Matt punched my arm again and again, giving me a charley horse that would last for weeks. At first, I didn't protest. I felt like I deserved it. But then it started to hurt worse and worse, and I needed to get away more than anything. I felt like something in my arm was going to rupture or break or worse. But no matter how hard I struggled, the two larger, stronger boys held me in place. Finally, after what felt like hours, I could take no more, and crumpled to the ground, curling into a ball still trying to protect my egg. Matt said some parting words which I barely heard, no longer caring what he thought about me. Once upon a time, we'd been friends. I'd gone to his house and gone to his birthday parties. But that felt like a different lifetime, a century ago in another universe. I walked home from school feeling crushed and weak, wincing every time someone ran past me on the sidewalk thinking it might be Matt coming to lay another beating on me. Looking over my shoulder again and again, I had a feeling he would be coming for me. What he'd done to me at recess wasn't enough. It would never be enough. When I glanced back, I saw him running down the sidewalk trying to catch up with me. I pretended not to notice. Then, when I went around the next corner, I began to run. A few seconds later, I looked back to see he had several of his friends from the hockey team with him. They were running full tilt, screaming and laughing at me as I ran away. Their threats made me certain that if they caught me, they would hurt me worse than I'd ever been hurt before. I really wanted to avoid that. I turned onto a path leaving the road, racing towards the forest. Immediately, I regretted the decision, knowing that I was headed towards an even more secluded area far away from the relative safety of city streets and plenty of witnesses. But it was too late to turn back now. The bullies were right behind me, gaining on me fast. I threw my backpack to the ground, trying to gain any advantage I could, and heard one of them tumble to the ground when they tripped over it. I'll kill you for that! I heard him yelling after me, but I didn't look back. By the time I got to the forest, I realized they weren't behind me anymore. They were still trailing me, but at a jogging pace now. They were pulling binders and school books out of my backpack and scattering them everywhere as they walked. Man, you really shouldn't litter, Matt was saying, joined by jeers and laughter from the others. All this stuff has your name on it. You should really come back and pick it up. Look, there goes your math textbook. That must be worth like 50 bucks, right? I winced, hearing him tear pages from it as they followed me into the forest. It probably cost more than $100, I thought, which I'd have to pay back after the school year ended. 
Either way, I wasn't turning around for the backpack. I would take my life over my school books any day. The path was too obvious, I realized. Knowing I had temporarily lost them in the trees, I decided to veer off from it. I had to get creative if I wanted to lose them. So I went off the path and ran through some bushes, heading away from the trail. It didn't take long for them to notice, and I heard them crunching through leaves as they followed me a few seconds later. I see you, Matt shouted, and I looked back to see who was pointing right at me. And I am gonna fucking kill you. It was an accident, I wanted to scream. But it wouldn't make any difference. None of it mattered to him. He just wanted blood now. Running as fast as I could through the fallen leaves, I tripped over a branch. It was hidden by the rusted brown and yellow foliage, and so I hadn't seen it. When I looked up, I realized there was a hiding place just beside me that I would never have noticed if not for tripping. A large, hollowed-out log was to my right, and I crawled inside of it. It was large enough for me to fit inside, but just barely. I held my breath, hearing the sounds of footsteps coming closer. The other boys were right outside, looking for me. He was here a second ago, one of them said. I saw him. Patiently, I waited for them to leave, hoping they wouldn't linger for too long. The log was wet beneath my ass, and I felt the rotten moisture leaking through my pants. I noticed movement to my right and looked to see a fat spider crawling on the ceiling of my hiding spot. And just beyond, there were millipedes, potato bugs, and little red worms which squirmed and wriggled as they poked their heads from the decaying wood. There were probably more of them beneath me, and I realized I felt movement under me. The entire rotten log was alive with insects and creepy crawlies. Horrified and sick to my stomach, I nearly burst out of there screaming. But I stayed where I was and hoped they would leave. Instead, the boys lingered nearby far too close for comfort. See in there? I heard one of them ask. With fear overwhelming my revulsion, I set down my precious egg and clambered further into the decaying log. I crawled through thick spider webs as things skittered down my back and into my pants, biting back a scream and forcing myself to continue forward. All the way to the end, or at least what I thought was the end of the hollow log. Instead of bumping up against a rock or roots or cold hard ground, I kept crawling, into the darkest place I'd ever been. Something about it was calling to me, even more than my sense of curiosity at this strange world which seemed to be opening up all around me. I sensed by the noise of my movements that I was now in a wide open space, damp and cold like a cave, and I felt around, realizing I could stand up now. I sensed there was something just ahead of me, and I reached out to feel a smooth, wooden surface. My hand probed the flat surface for any marker or indication of what it might be, and suddenly I felt something round and polished jutting out from it. For a few seconds, I couldn't figure it out because the context clues were all wrong. Whatever this thing was didn't belong here. It belonged in a house, not a cave beneath the forest. It was a doorknob, which meant that this was a door. But where could it possibly lead to? I decided to take my chances with whatever was on the other side, rather than risking another confrontation with Matt and his friends. My heart was pounding fast as I turned the handle, deciding to take a chance and explore further in this strange place. Maybe it was a hobbit's hole, my young mind thought, or the home of a leprechaun. As I stepped through into another world, I forgot all about Matt and the other boys who were looking to beat me up. As the door swung open, I was hit by a blast of cold air, much more chilly than the damp basement feeling of the cave I had just been in. This new place was in the middle of winter, and it was full of blowing snow, whereas the place I'd just come from was relatively warm. I was wearing jeans and a hoodie, and I was immediately freezing cold and shivering. Whoa, I exclaimed, unable to stop myself from wandering forward. Scared of going too far from the door, I hesitantly began to explore this new place. I pushed my way out through the thick fir trees, and eventually found myself in a clearing surrounded by forest. It was dim outside, but it was daylight. 
The sky overhead was obscured by thick, swirling gray clouds which dumped snow down constantly. My feet were instantly soaked and freezing cold, since my running shoes were not made for this sort of weather. Clutching myself and rubbing my arms to regain some warmth, I decided this was too much to bear. I was about to turn back, but then I heard the sound of tiny bells jingling, and a voice speaking to me from nearby. It was a woman's voice, soft and sweet like music to my ears. "'Oh, dear boy,' she said, emerging from behind a tree. Her hair was dark, and she was dressed in gray robes, the same color as the clouds, covered in little silver tinkling bells. "'How did you find yourself stranded here in the forests of Hollow's End?' Part of me wanted to turn and run, but her smile was warm and friendly, and the little bells reminded me of Christmas, so I found myself staying. Oh, hello. Nice to meet you. Actually, I'm not stranded. There's a door back there. I, I found this place by accident, and... Ooh, it's cold, but beautiful. I think I'll have to be heading back now. She came a little closer, and I saw she was very pretty. Her face looked like it belonged to a supermodel or a famous actress whose name I couldn't place, and I found myself staring at her intently, despite my desire to go back to where I'd come from where it was warmer. Then, before I knew it, she was standing right in front of me. If you're cold, I can get you a coat. And some hot cocoa, would you like that? I felt myself nodding and she took my hand in her own freezing cold one, and when she touched me, my entire body became covered with goosebumps, and I found myself going with her. She led me away from the door I'd come through, and deeper into the cold and wintry world of Hollow's End. A little while later, we were sitting inside someplace warm, although I didn't remember walking there. I had a fur coat around my shoulders, and I was sipping cocoa, staring at the beautiful woman across from me. She was old enough to be my teacher, and it should have felt rude, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. And she didn't say anything, only looked at me with that same warm smile. But then, her happy expression dropped, and she looked away. As a tear dripped from her cheek, spilling onto the floor, where it immediately froze solid. Her lower lip quivered as she said a silent apology to me. What's wrong? I asked. Nothing, she said. How's your hot chocolate? Delicious. And it was. The best I'd ever tasted. Are you hungry? She asked, wiping away the tears which had turned to snowflakes on her face. Yes, I'm very hungry, I replied. I couldn't help it. I was starving. My stomach was rumbling, and it felt like I should have eaten dinner hours ago. And yet, time was funny here. I wasn't entirely sure how long I'd been in this world on the other side of the door. But the groans from my belly were saying it had been a very long time. What is your favorite thing in the world to eat? I thought about this for a second, and it didn't take me long to come up with an answer. My mom's beef stew, I said. It's the best. Her face lit up in a warm grin again, and she got up and went to the stove. I noticed for the first time there was a black pot simmering there. Oh, what do you know? That's exactly what I'm making for dinner tonight. Beef stew. My mouth started watering at the smell. It was exactly like what I remembered from home. Which reminded me I should be going back there. My mom would be worried about me. Something about this was creeping me out, too. The more I thought about home and the strange situation I was in... Images of Hansel and Gretel crossed my mind, although I hadn't yet labeled this woman with the dreaded W word. I didn't think she'd like it if I called her that, even if it was true. I was about to open my mouth to say I had to leave when she presented me with a steaming bowl filled with beef stew, and I forgot what I'd been thinking about. The dish looked just like my mom's, and the smell was overwhelming. Next, she set down a board with a freshly baked loaf of bread sitting atop it, steaming and warm with butter ready for spreading. I couldn't possibly leave right after she'd done all this for me, I thought to myself, and began to dig in. The meat was tender. 
the broth perfectly thick and seasoned, and the carrots, potatoes, and onions had just the right amount of bite. It was the best beef stew I'd ever eaten, peppery and hot, and I quickly downed two bowls, devouring four slices of warm, crunchy, fresh bread, slathered in salted butter, which I used to mop up the puddles at the bottom of my bowl. Wiping my face with a napkin, I belched loudly and excused myself, my face turning red with embarrassment. No need to apologize. A healthy burp is a sign of a properly cooked meal in my books, she said from across the table. I realized then that she hadn't eaten anything, and felt bad for not noticing earlier. I'm just not very hungry these days, she said as if reading my thoughts. But I'm glad I could make you happy with a meal. The greatest joy in life is feeding people, I always say. That's what my mom always says, too. It wasn't quite what she said, but close enough. The woman's face broke again, and frozen tears began to pour from both eyes as she let out a gut-wrenching sob. It was startling after our pleasant conversation so far, but obviously there was something deeply troubling this woman. What's wrong? I asked. I'm not sure if I can help, but I'd be happy to try. That's sweet of you to offer, she said. But you're just a boy. I need someone... Well, someone who can be very, very sneaky. No, I'm sorry, it's it's too dangerous. What's too dangerous? I asked, curious now. She walked over to the fireplace and looked into the flames. Then, after some time, she began to speak. It's been years since I've been trapped in this place. An outcast sent to live at the edge of the forest. Her voice was sad and almost brought me to tears as she continued her tragic tale. My family once ruled this land. We were fair and just. Everyone in Hollow's End had enough to eat. It was warm and the sun was shining every day. Crops grew tall in the soil of our lands, towering to the height of trees. There was always more than enough to go around. But then, a great beast emerged from the forest. It was a jungle cat, large and white, and with it came the snow. The great tiger was intelligent, and could speak and enthrall the hearts of men. He convinced them to take my crown from me. And with it, I lost my power to hold back this never-ending winter. The trees went bare overnight. The crops began to wither and fail. And soon there was little to eat and never enough to go around. She showed me the bottom of the pot of stew and the few scraps that remained, then set it down to rest on the stove. You gave me all of it? I asked, stunned and heartbroken. But you don't even know me. My mother always taught me to be kind. To help strangers lost in the cold. I thought about this for a few moments before making an impulse decision I would come to greatly regret. Well, my mom taught me stuff too. And I want to help you. Just tell me what you need me to do. If you need someone to be sneaky, well, I'll be the sneakiest sneak you've ever seen. I'll get your crown back for you from that tiger. She smiled at me. But this time it didn't feel so warm. In fact, I felt a chill run up my spine as she began to laugh and nod, telling me, Good boy. Very good boy. I found myself outside, dressed in a thick black fur coat and boots, trudging through the snow. There was a sword in a scabbard attached to my belt, and I had a vague memory of being taught how to use it. How much time has passed? How long did you spend learning to use that sword? Your mother must be missing you. Panicked thoughts ran through my mind, but they were suppressed now. They were at the back, hidden, far away where I couldn't get to them. The only thing that was important now was the mission, getting the crown, and I could see the glow of it in the distance, shining silver with the magic beacon cast by the witch. She's a witch! 
woman who was so kind and so good to me. Heading further and further away from the door, which had brought me to this strange place, but that thought didn't really trouble me anymore. Now I was focused on my mission. Getting back the crown was all that mattered. The crown. The crown. The crown. At some point I realized I was standing right in front of a gate. Not only that, but someone was speaking to me. Your name, sir. Revere Frostborn the Eighth, I answered, the strange words coming out with no conscious effort. My voice sounded deeper, I noticed, and looked down to see my hands were lined and cracked, calluses formed at the tips of my fingers from many years of hard labor, or sword play. Ah, we've been expecting you for some time, the man said. I looked him up and down and saw he was a guard dressed in a suit of armor, and there were dozens of others like him all around me. I was in a castle, like something out of Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. There were tapestries on the wall and flickering torches hung beside them as I was marched down a long corridor, deeper and deeper into the heart of a grand and ancient keep. After going through numerous lines of guards, each larger and more ornately armored than the last, we finally arrived at a massive entryway. There, the guard who had been my escort left me. I looked up at the eight new guards who stood at the doorway, far more formidable looking than my previous escort, each dressed in gold armor fringed with red, brandishing the sharpest and most ornate looking spears I'd ever seen. They blocked my entrance and said nothing. For a moment I couldn't think what they could be expecting of me, but then the words came from my lips before I could even register their meaning. The armies of the Frostborn Giants have a proposal, I said. I must speak to him. The guards parted for me and I walked through their midst, entering the largest and most lavishly decorated throne room I had ever seen. Sounds of clanking, rattling armor could be heard behind me, and I realized that the guards were escorting me the rest of the way, towards what appeared to be a huge throne in the distance. As I got closer, I realized it wasn't a person sitting on the purple throne. It was a white tiger. Much larger than any jungle cat I'd ever seen on Earth, this beast was easily three times the size of a white Bengal tiger. And sitting atop its head was a golden crown. The crown, get the crown, you must get the crown. The words ran through my head feverishly running over every other consideration like a steamroller. Once I was close enough to smell the fish on the great cat's breath, it spoke. Why do you come here? It asked in a deep baritone voice which rattled my eardrums. Do you seek to steal my crown for the silver witch of the forest? Get the crown. The command running through my mind was interrupted suddenly. And for the first time in a long while, I could think for myself. But I wasn't sure how long it would last. How did you know I came for your crown? The guard's spears were suddenly at my throat from eight different angles, less than an inch away. My heart was pounding fast. I can smell her on you. Cats have much better noses than people. Lower your weapons. He did not realize what he was doing. He still doesn't. The Silver Witch is cunning. You all know that. The guards lowered their spears reluctantly. Lichen, Freja, go. Ready the men for an attack. This is most likely a diversion, the tiger said, and the two guards ran off. The other six formed a defensive formation all around us. Frederick, come quickly. I need your expertise. A white-haired wizard carrying a staff shuffled over and immediately began pawing at my head as if inspecting for lice. Ah, yes, just as I would have suspected. 
He pulled something out from the back of my skull, which continued to emerge for a long, long time as he yanked at it, as if he were pulling an invisible snake from my brain. As he gathered it and looped it into a coil, the great tiger began to whisper in my ear. She can't hear us anymore. Now listen closely, boy. This is what you must do. I was walking again. The cold wind was blowing in my face and the snow was stinging my skin. But I had my wits again. I could think for myself. The king of Hollow's End devised a plan to rid the land of the witch once and for all. But it would be up to me to implement it. If I failed, she would have everything she needed to take over again. And to plunge this other world into permanent darkness. She's far too powerful even for me to defeat, the king had told me. But you will have the advantage. You will be able to catch her by surprise. In a way in which none of us could. The crown was in my hand, the snow crunching beneath my boots. There was a very long road ahead of me although I didn't remember traveling it the first time. I would be present for every moment of this leg back. Fortunately for me, the king's throne room had been imbued with a powerful magic, put in place by the wizard Frederick. The witch wasn't aware of his power, or his presence, otherwise she wouldn't have risked sending me alone. But now I was in a place of advantage. All I had to do was get her to put on the crown, and it would drain her of all of her magic, making her powerless, due to a hex placed upon it by the wizard Frederick. Without her magic, the witch would freeze like ice, and shatter into a million pieces. I continued to walk, pondering my plan and every possible thing that could go wrong. For years, I marched through the cold and the snow, attacked by bandits some days while on others I had nothing to eat. There were good friends made along the way, enemies vanquished and companions lost to sickness and arrows. Yet, somehow, I managed to survive. By the time I made it back to that frozen forest, I was a changed man. No longer a boy. Those days were long forgotten. I hardly remembered how I came to be in this place, and part of me suspected I'd lived here all along that those previous memories were simply another hex placed upon me by the witch. The sound of tinkling bells broke me from my thoughts, and I looked up to see her standing there right in front of me, only inches away. You're back, she said with that same smile like an eel about to eat supper. Do you have it? No questions of how I was or whether I'd run into trouble. No thank you for my years. No, decades of journeying to fetch it for her. My hands shaking with barely concealed rage, I fetched it from beneath the folds of my tattered cloak and handed it to her. You're shaking, she said, taking it from me. Her voice was nervous and slightly suspicious. Are you alright? The years have done a number on me, my lady. I am not the boy I once was. I have grown old in my quest to find this for you. And to slay the great tiger who stole your throne. But you have done it? He is dead? I nodded. Yes. He is dead. Smiling wider, she began to put the crown on top of her head, lowering it to the point where it almost rested there. It hovered for several long moments. But then, she pulled it away. No, she muttered. Too easy. Her face was getting red with rage, and I realized she had caught me. You shouldn't be able to tell your own age. That was part of the spell. It was supposed to keep you blind to how much time you spent here. A variation on the hex which enchants my forest. 
She raised her hand, and a bolt of energy deformed the air in front of me, causing it to shimmer. And then it moved over me, enveloping me. It was pure heat. Like the air just above a fire where you would toast your marshmallows. I screamed as the boiling air began to melt my skin, setting my fur cloak ablaze. You will learn not to disobey me again, said the witch, inspecting the crown in her hands with disinterest. But for now... Pain. The scorching air got even hotter somehow, and my hair caught on fire a second later. Now I couldn't even scream. My voice was caught, my face frozen in a grimace of sheer agony. Time stretched out forever, although it only lasted a few instants. Then, thankfully, the burning haze was extinguished by a snowy gust of wind. Enough, witch. You have destroyed this poor boy's life. Now you will pay. It was the wizard, I realized with relief. He had come to save me. And not only that, but he was riding on the back of the great white tiger king. Frederick leapt from his back and began to advance on the witch as the tiger flanked her from the other side. He held out his staff in front of him and cast bolts of white lightning at the witch, who in turn sent them ricocheting in every direction, deflecting them with a swirling gray cloud which she manipulated expertly. One bolt of lightning deflected back exactly at Frederick, hitting him center mass and sending him flying backwards. After hurtling through the air several yards, he landed against a rock where he lay motionless. Frederick! The Tiger King shouted, abandoning his attack and racing across the snow to his fallen friend. The Grey Witch was moving towards the King, slowly closing the distance from behind, and I realized she would kill him if I didn't do anything. And then I saw the crown lying in the snow. I would only have one chance. And I would need to be very sneaky. You thought you could kill me? The witch was saying, sending a shimmering orb of heat towards the Tiger King. You really thought you could kill me? The tiger lunged at her ankle, ducking beneath the orb of magic at the last second and grabbing hold of her leg in his jaw. Now! He yelled around the bloody flesh in his mouth. Do it now! I didn't hesitate. As the witch was distracted, screaming in pain, I jammed the crown on top of her head, twisting it further onto her forehead until it covered her eyes and was impossible to remove. It began to turn red, then white hot as she howled in pain and tried to pry it off, but it wouldn't budge. The witch began to freeze from top to bottom, turning into an ice sculpture of herself, before she shattered into a million pieces. Sadly, a few minutes after the witch died, so did Frederick the wizard. He managed to hang on for a little while, just long enough for his magic to send the witch back to hell where she belonged, but then his injuries overcame him. He had used the most powerful magic available to him, in his effort to stop the witch, and she had turned it around on him, deflecting it right back at his own heart. A tear ran down the Tiger King's cheek as I held out my hand to stroke his soft, warm fur. His eyes were brimming with tears as he spoke. You should go home. Your family will be missing you. That was just a lie from the witch. This is my home. It always has been. The rest was just a dream. Come, said the Tiger King. Let me show you something. He led me towards a thicket of trees. Pushing a few branches aside with his great paw, he went into them, the sticky sap leaving brown smears on his white coat. In there, he said, pointing to a strange door, isolated and alone in the middle of the forest. That is where your true life lies. Looking back, one day you will think that this was just a dream. Memories flooded back of my mother and father, 
my friends and family, and of course, the bullies who had tormented me. It's been so long. There's nothing left for me there. Time works differently in some worlds. That's what Frederick always told me. He himself was from another world. And he said he would return there. And only a few hours would have passed. Perhaps it will be the same for you. There is only one way to find out. I looked at him and found that now I was crying. I gave the enormous tiger a hug and he lifted his paw to hug me back retracting his enormous claws to do so. You are always welcome in my kingdom, if you wish to return one day. And with that, I left him behind, pushing open the door and going back into the cave on the other side. I found myself back on Earth, and once again in the form of a boy, Unsure how much time precisely had passed, I scrambled out of the log and looked around for any sign of the bullies who had tormented me so many years ago. Something crunched beneath my foot as I made my way out of the log, and I looked down to see it was my egg, the sacred egg which I had been tasked with keeping safe. It seemed so silly now. I had a good average in all my classes, Failing the egg project didn't mean anything, really. Except maybe for Matt, who was barely passing. Maybe he would have to be held back because of my blunder. Suddenly I felt bad for dropping his egg. Even if he had beaten me up for it. I hoped he would pass and get to graduate. I found my backpack at the entrance to the forest with all of my papers tossed on the grass. My math textbook was fine, though. Despite what he'd said, Matt hadn't ripped it up. He'd only torn out blank pages from a notebook. Maybe he felt bad. After I'd gathered up my belongings, I began walking home again. Halfway there, I looked up and saw Matt. He was on the front porch of his house, looking like he didn't really want to go inside. A man and a woman were yelling at each other loud enough to be heard from the street. Hey, Matt. I called over to him. He looked up and appeared angry for a second, but then seemed to do a double take. He walked over to me and looked me up and down. Yeah, what's up with you? You look different, he said. Eh, just had some time to think, I replied. Doesn't give you an excuse to be a dick to me, but I'm sorry I smashed your egg. It was a mistake. Somebody pushed me from behind and went flying. Yeah, okay, he said. What deal? Still gonna graduate. Just barely, though. That's good. I thought for a second to myself. Hey, um... Do you want to come hang out at my place for a bit? I've got the new Street Fighter game. And I've got some eggs and a Sharpie. After two years in his class, I've gotten pretty good at forging Mr. Geis's signature. He smiled and nodded and the two of us left the sounds of muffled arguments on the other side of the door and walked away down the street together. This all happened many years ago. I'm in my late thirties now, and the memories of my other life in that other world have faded. But I still remember how to use a sword. And I still remember the terror I felt as the Silver Witch of Hollow's End set me on fire with her magic. That time while it consumed me felt like it was drawn out forever. And I realized over the years why that was. In the case of the witch's magic, time does not heal all wounds. It makes little difference. I think about that sometimes when I'm trying to fall asleep at night, tossing and turning from the unquenchable pain. In the darkness of my bedroom, every time I see a shadow that looks vaguely like a person, I'm convinced it's her, and that she's laughing in the darkness, tormenting me with her magic. 
It doesn't matter that she's dead. Now I know that there are an infinite number of different worlds out there. An infinite variety of horrific things waiting just in the shadows out of sight. How many doors leading to other worlds are there out there? And what would we do if someone like the Silver Witch steps through into our world? What if they're already here? Or someone else, much worse. Thank you for watching tonight's video, listening to tonight's story. Hope you enjoyed. This story was previously featured on the Dr. No Sleep podcast. I'll include a link in the description below if you want to check out his uh, podcast and YouTube channel. Uh, this story is also featured in my new book, which is just being released. Uh, it's actually available on Amazon now. And it's titled From the Darkness. There'll be a, a link in the description below if you want to check out the book. And this is a collection of short horror stories all written by me. There's a bunch of stories in here that have uh, been on podcasts and one story that's never been seen anywhere else before. Um, so if you enjoy my writing and you want to uh, support my work and, and purchase a copy of my book, hope you'll check out the description below or check out Amazon for the book From the Darkness by Jordan Group. Thanks, everybody, for listening. If you've received a message from MaxStack719 on Kick, don't respond. They want you to play the Kick game. And it isn't what it seems. I've never thought of myself as a stupid kid, but today I know I am. I started playing the Kick game, and now I'm in deep shit. It all started like most anything in my life does. I was bored as hell on a Saturday morning and playing around on my cell phone. My parents were out of town for a work conference and I was home alone for the week. It's spring break and most of my friends are down at the coast with their parents or other classmates, digging their toes into the sand. My broke ass was sitting at home, wishing I had gotten a job and saved up money to go with them. I had already made my morning rounds on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. But the photos of my friends having fun in far-off places had already pissed me off, so I decided repeating that cycle wouldn't improve things. The microwave beeped from the kitchen, signaling that my breakfast sandwich had been nuked to perfection, so I tossed my phone on the couch and went to go grab it. As I was setting the hot plate on the counter and pouring a glass of juice, I heard a ping from my phone in the living room, so I headed back in to see if one of my friends was taunting me with pictures from the beach. I scooped the phone up and saw the kick notification on my screen, saying I had a new message from MaxStack719. It wasn't the screen name I knew, but I decided to check it anyway just in case. Opening up the app, I hit the accept chat button and read the message. MaxStack719. Hey there, want to play the kick game? Easy money, and you can quit any time. I rolled my eyes at the low effort message from a bot that was no doubt going to try to sell me porn or get a bank transfer number. Without fail, I got about seven messages a day like this one, trying to link me to some stupid shit. On the off chance that there's an actual human behind it that I can mess around with, I would often message back just to waste their time. Fake kick name. Hell yeah bro, let's play. How do I win this easy money? I waited a few minutes but didn't get a response. The bot was probably broken or poorly programmed like most of them, so I started eating my sandwich. A few bites in, I heard the ping again. Max Stack 719. Take a picture holding up three fingers with a ring of any type on one of them. Once we've received it, we will send you an Amazon gift card code for $50. Hold up three fingers with a ring on? What the hell? I went to my parents' room and fished a ring out of my mother's jewelry box and slid it on the end of my middle finger and took the picture. The ring didn't slide all the way down, but the message didn't say it had to. Without a second thought, I sent the picture to MaxStack719 and went back to my sandwich. There was no way I would get the gift card, but it only cost me about two minutes of my life, so it was worth a shot. A few minutes later, I received a message back with what looked like a gift card code and figured I would try it out. Firing up my Amazon app, I copied and pasted the code into the redemption box and waited. To my shock, my available balance went from zero to fifty dollars. Who knew that kickbots actually paid out? 
my phone pinged and I opened the new message from MacStack719. MacStack719. Great job. If you want to keep playing the kick game for more great prizes, then please take a picture of yourself holding a hammer in your right hand and send it to us for another $50 Amazon gift card. Immediately, I shot to the garage and dug through my dad's old toolboxes until I found a shabby old claw hammer. I held it up to the light in my right hand and took a picture. As I headed back inside, I sent the picture to MacStack719 and waited patiently. Just like the last time, I received a new code a few minutes later and added it to my Amazon account. It was verified and my balance shot up to $100. I was dumbstruck. MacStack719. Good job, fake kick name. Are you ready to make some real money now? Fake kick name. Hell yes, keep it coming. MacStack719. Use a sharpie to draw a smiley face on the head of the hammer. Take the hammer to your nearest gas station parking lot and take a picture. The picture must include two intersecting street signs. One of our kick game representatives will go and verify it is there. If they find it, you will receive a redemption code for a $500 Visa gift card. I didn't even bother to respond. My legs were pumping the pedals on my bike within minutes of receiving the last message. The hammer was in my backpack and bounced against my back as I pedaled toward the nearest pump and go I could think of. Luckily, it sat on a corner and had two intersecting street signs. When I got there, I found a concrete retainer to sit the hammer on, where you could see both of the street signs as well as the pump and go logo sign. I placed the hammer on the retainer and snapped a picture. Uploading it as quickly as I could, I waited for a follow-up message. Within about two minutes, I received the visa code. I checked it online and nearly shit my pants. The code worked. The phone pinged again. MacStack719. That's all for now. We will be back later this afternoon with more exciting opportunities. I pedaled my bike home and sat down on the couch and started browsing Amazon for opportunities to waste my newly found money. It still wasn't quite afternoon when my phone pinged again. Looking at the username from the message, I saw it was MacStack719 again, so I opened it immediately. MacStack719. We're ahead of schedule here at the kick game. Are you ready to win some really big money, fake kick name? Fake kick name. 100%, just name it. MacStack719. Go back to the gas station where you left the hammer and check beside the dumpster. There is a brand new sealed pack of cigarettes just behind it. Video yourself smoking five of them in less than ten minutes and win a thousand dollar Visa gift card. Be sure to drop them on the ground and stomp them out. Fire safety is priority number one. I hesitated for a moment after reading this one. It hadn't occurred to me earlier when I dropped the hammer off, but MaxStack719 had said a kick game representative lived in my city. I hadn't even questioned how they knew what city I was in. The money I was winning had blinded me to some potential concerns I should have had, and they were just now catching up with me. Fake kick name. Thanks for all the money, but how did you know I was in a city where you had a representative? MaxStack719. Trial and error, my friend. Sometimes we lose a bit of money after the three finger and hammer picture verification test. It turns out that a lot of kick game players aren't in the right cities. When you sent the picture with the cross streets and gas station, we were able to Google the location and verify that you are in an applicable city. At the time, it seemed like a half-ass answer. But I had seen hundreds of weird stories like this online, where some YouTuber or influencer ran social experiments like this, and I just figured I had stumbled on one. I decided to continue playing along and headed back to the gas station on my bike. Even though I had never smoked a cigarette before, I figured five for a thousand dollars was a small price to pay. When I arrived at the gas station, I pulled my bike around back and leaned it on the wooden fencing surrounding the dumpster. Just beside it on the ground, I saw a sealed pack of cigarettes on the ground with a lighter on top. I opened the package and stuck one in my mouth before turning on my camera and lighting it up. The acrid smoke made me cough, but I adjusted after a few puffs. As I smoked the cigarettes and stomped them out, I just stared into the camera. I felt stupid and a little freaked out now that I was there. The cigarettes tasted awful and made my eyes water. 
but I just kept lighting them and puffing away. Eventually, I figured out I didn't even have to inhale them, since you wouldn't be able to tell from the video if I did anyway. After I was done, I crushed out the last smoldering butt and pointed the camera down to the pile of butts to show I had stomped them out. As I was videoing the pile of cigarette butts, someone opened the back door of the convenience store. A middle-aged man with a long ponytail and a tattoo of a snake around his neck stepped outside and gave me an angry look. Hey, what are you doing, kid? The man asked in a gravelly voice. Get the hell out of here. You ain't old enough to be smoking. I sent the video to MacStack719, but didn't wait for a response. Instead, I just got on my bike and started pedaling back home, wondering why someone was paying a kid for pictures of a hammer and to smoke cigarettes behind a gas station. My stomach was in knots from a combination of the smoking and uneasy feeling I was starting to get from Max Stack 719's weird tasks. The gas station attendant discovering me had freaked me out quite a bit as well. When I walked back into the house after putting away my bike, I had two messages from Max Stack 719. The first one was another visa code, which checked out like all the others. The second was a new task. Max Stack 719. Great job so far. One last task, and this one is for a $2,500 Visa gift card. Delete this conversation, and send me a screenshot of the blank screen when completed. Once received, you will receive your final reward. I just wanted to be done with this uneasy sensation. So I deleted the conversation and took the screenshot. After I was done, I sent the screenshot of the blank chat window back to MacStack719. And that was the last message I sent or received from them. Fifteen or so minutes later, I got a message from a user named Final Reward 719 I opened it with a sense of unease. But it was another Visa gift code. This time, I didn't even bother checking it on the website because I knew it was good. I didn't respond either. There was no point, and I was done with this. Later that night, I was scrolling through TikTok, watching the usual videos of model flips awkward dancing, and filtered women lip-syncing to popular songs, when a new kick notification popped up on my phone. This time it was from someone called Look What You Did 719. I opened the app to see the message, and it just showed the JPEG icon. I tapped it, opened the picture, and nearly vomited. A man was crumpled on a tile floor in a pool of blood. His long ponytail was caked in crimson, and you could make out the head of a snake tattoo wrapping around his throat. His face had been pulverized into a liquid pile of meat and brain matter. There was a hammer propped up on its claws, head up, dripping with blood, and I could see the faint outline of a smiley face on it through the gore. A few cigarette butts were sprinkled around the body. I was still fighting the urge to puke when my phone pinged a final time. Look what you did, 719. Thanks for playing the kick game. Be careful out there, friend. I don't know what to do now. My fingerprints and DNA are all over that crime scene. Do I call the cops? What evidence do I have to show them? Maybe the gift cards will lead back to someone or they could track an IP address from the messages. But maybe they can't. I don't know, and I'm scared shitless. If someone messages you and asks you if you want to play the kick game, don't respond. I wish I hadn't. Some of you might be puzzled a bit about the title. An online scavenger hunt is a series of riddles or puzzles on the internet. Throughout the years, there have been quite a few of them. The most famous example, without a doubt, are the puzzles created by Cicada 3301. As long as I can think back, I've been interested in puzzles and riddles. I guess it's a mixture of curiosity and wanting to challenge myself. When I was little, I spent a lot of time with puzzle games and the like. Once I grew older, during the advent of the internet, I also started to look for them online. In the past, I've taken part in a few of them. Most of the ones I found were rather simple, and usually ended with a troll face or silly message. I know some supposedly reward the winner with a prize, like the cicada puzzles mentioned above. Regrettably, I've always missed out on them. 
two weeks ago, I finally got my chance to take part in an online puzzle that was a bit more complex. As I'm sitting here now, typing this out, I wish I hadn't. It was on a Saturday evening that I stumbled upon a strange Tumblr post. It had been reblogged by a few of the accounts I follow. Most of their content is about curious internet stories and hidden pages. When I saw that a post made the rounds, I took a more in-depth look. Going through the chain of comments and reblogs, I learned that people had actually deciphered a message included in the post. It led to a page on blogger.com that consisted of several cryptic blog posts. Most of them were quotes by famous people and a few nonsensical sentences below. Two of the posts even contain images. It didn't take long for me to find an invite to a Discord server that someone had created to solve whatever this was. All in all, there were about 30 people on the server. When I joined, only a few were actually online. They were busy talking about the blog post and trying to find a connection between the quotes. So far, it seemed nothing had proven useful. There was one user, however, that stuck out between the rest. His name was Firesnake89. While everyone was talking about the quotes and trying to figure out a hidden message, this guy said it was all a waste of time. His posts were riddled with insults like freaking idiots and mouth breathers. I sighed when I saw his messages. Found the troll, I thought. My opinion of him would soon change. It wasn't long before he proclaimed he'd figured it all out. Of course, people called him out. After five minutes of explaining and mentioning the power of his boundless autism, everyone was quiet. The quotes, he said, were all from famous works of fiction. That's all there was to them. Sure, the theme of the quotes was related, but that was only there to lead people astray. He continued on about different editions of books, publishers, checksums, and a hidden message on the website itself. It wasn't too tough, he bragged. Just a bit tricky. Sitting in front of my computer, I couldn't help but be impressed by this guy. I had no clue how he'd figured out half of it. Let's see if you dumbasses can figure out the rest on your own, he wrote, and posted a line of numbers and letters. My first impulse was to enter it into Google, but that didn't give me any results. A chat message by another user proved that I wasn't the only one dumb enough to try this. At first, I started to calculate the sum of the numbers between the letters, to see if that gave me a hint. It was all nonsense, though. Another attempt at using Google didn't help either. I sat there, puzzled, staring at the numbers and letters when it hit me. I'd seen something like this before, hadn't I? All the letters were from early in the alphabet. There had to be a reason for this. Right away, a memory from my IT class came back to me. Hex code consisted of nothing but numbers and the first six letters of the alphabet. Looking at the line that Firesnake had posted, I realized that the highest letter was indeed an F. That was the highest letter in hex code as well. I started dividing up the line into pairs, which gave me this. 696E, 73, 74, 61, 67, and so on. Moments later, I entered it into a hex converter. I'd expected it to give me nothing but a garbled mess, but what appeared on my screen was the URL of an Instagram profile. Instagram.com forward slash blurpy1. I blinked, pressed convert again, and then entered the URL into my browser. To my surprise, a somewhat typical Instagram profile appeared on my screen. It was supposedly the profile of a 22-year-old girl. There was a URL that led to a simple WordPress site. The account itself consisted of half a dozen pictures, all of the same girl. I posted it in the Discord chat. Three other users were still trying to figure out what the line of numbers and letters meant. Once I'd posted it, the chat was quiet for a moment, before people asked me to explain. The first reply came from Firesnake saying that there seemed to be at least one person with half a brain in here. I'm a bit embarrassed, but I smiled at this compliment by someone who was obviously much smarter than me. For the next half hour, I started to check out the Instagram profile, as well as the WordPress site. I didn't even know where to start. I clicked through the pictures, checked out comments, read through the WordPress site, but I was utterly overwhelmed. In the end, I said goodbye to the people on Discord, told them I'd be there tomorrow, and headed to bed. When I got up the next day, the first thing I did was to recheck Discord. 
the chat was a bit more active now, and quite a few people were online. Most of them talked about the WordPress site, on which they'd supposedly found a hint. I was about to ask them what they'd found, but I saw I'd gotten a message by Firesnake. It was a simple one-liner. That WordPress site is a red herring. Check the hashtags. I asked him what he meant, but I saw he wasn't online at the moment, or at least invisible. Needless to say, I didn't get an answer. It was about an hour later that I put the next clue together. A short little riddle. It took me quite a bit to figure out the answer, but once I did, the next step was clear. Use Google Images. I was about to post it in the general chat of the Discord, but the moment I was about to send it, I paused. Then I deleted the message and opened the private chat with Firesnake. This time, a reply came back almost instantly. Not bad, was all I got. After I'd returned from the kitchen to get another cup of coffee, he'd sent me a couple more messages. So far, he hadn't figured out the next step. He said he had a few ideas, but nothing feasible. I asked him why he didn't say anything in the general chat, and his answer was short. You think those idiots can figure shit out? When I took a look at the chat... I saw that people were still analyzing the WordPress site. To be honest, he had a point. It was from this time onward that we started to work together. I had planned to hang out with friends that Saturday, but I ended up canceling. Instead, I spent the rest of the day figuring out a few more clues with Firesnake. To be honest, I had no clue why he needed my help. Apart from a few flashes of inspiration, I felt utterly useless and always a few steps behind. I was hooked on solving this thing, though. I really wanted to see where it would lead us. For the next couple of days, I was obsessed with this thing. I did nothing but going to work and trying to figure out clues. Even at work, I spent more time with these online riddles than actually doing my job. During these days, Firesnake and I scanned various websites, Facebook profiles, talked to automated chatbots, and even sent an email to an auto-replier. This whole thing was nothing short of absolutely fascinating. I also learned a few more things about my new friend. He told me his real name was Mike. He'd been kicked out of university a good year ago, and ever since, he'd been unemployed. The guy seemed to be the prime example of a basement dweller, but man, was he smart. He told me he dabbled in a few things online, like cryptocurrencies, private bot networks, and automated blogs. So far, none of them had really taken off. So for now, he spent most of his days on the internet, doing things like this online scavenger hunt. Needless to say, he was quite the weirdo. Still, figuring out this thing together was fun. It was near the end of the week that I told him I'd not be around for a while. I'd be attending a family gathering on Friday and Saturday. He gave me his condolences and made a few weird jokes, but said I should have fun. He'd see what he could figure out on his own. While I was with my family, I still checked Discord on my phone every once in a while. There was the occasional message by him, in which he told me what progress he'd made. On Saturday afternoon, he got quiet. When I got back home, I sent him a message, joking how unexpected it was for him to be stuck that long. I figured he'd be offline, but even after a couple of hours had passed, I got no reply. After that, I decided to follow his progress. It was much harder than expected. Mike had a cryptic way of talking, and always forgot to mention half the things he'd figured out. I messaged him a few more times, asking about some of the clues, but still got no reply. Had he solved the whole thing on his own already? If so, fuck me. In the end, I decided to solve this thing on my own, if that was even possible. I checked the general chat, but people were still way behind. As I kept going, I noticed a few things. The links that led me on weren't hard-coded anymore. Instead, they seemed to be dynamically generated. At first, I didn't know what to make of it, but then it clicked. From a certain point onward, it seemed that people got their own private clues. I couldn't help but smile. This was very interesting. I wondered how much effort went into creating a thing like this. Maybe this was the reason Mike hadn't answered me. I was sure he'd figured this out days ago and was busy solving them on his own now. Making progress was tough. I noticed that things got a bit easier, though. Before, it had all been about hidden messages and metadata. Now it was more about simple riddles or figuring out specific lines of text. Maybe it was to discourage team efforts from here on out. 
Either way, I continued on. It was five days ago that one of the clues made me scratch my head. It was clear that I was supposed to figure out a specific location. I went over it and couldn't help but laugh when I realized that my home area would fit the clue quite well. I continued tinkering with it, but the longer I did, the more it seemed I'd already found the solution. It was, without a doubt, my home area's name. I sat back, a, a bit confused. So far, all the clues and riddles had been in English, and were related to American pop culture. So why did it suddenly talk about an area in the middle of nowhere in Germany? I shrugged it off. Maybe the creator of this thing had included a few bits and pieces here and there related to my IP address. It wouldn't be too far-fetched, and it was an excellent addition. Still, were those riddles and clues automated as well? Would someone go to such lengths for something like this? The next clue proved that indeed he would. I felt weird when I was sent to the Wikipedia page of the next town over. I was supposed to search through the recent edits. In there, I found a link to yet another random blog post. The next clue, however, sent me to a picture stream showing locations in my town. I leaned back in my chair, baffled. How in the hell? Finding the rough area where I lived was one thing, but finding my exact town solely via IP was impossible. It made no sense. Was it a coincidence? Could it be that this thing was just using different towns in the area? The riddle this time was simple. It was a URL hidden in the website's code. Once I'd followed the link, though, I couldn't pretend that this was all happening by chance anymore. What I stared at was a picture of my room, obviously recorded by my webcam. For a while, I sat there, too shocked to do anything. Then my hand shot forward, turning the camera away before I disconnected it altogether. What the hell was going on? Then I realized I must have been hacked. This whole thing had just turned into a stupid joke to fuck with me, hadn't it? Well, really funny, I thought. Really fucking funny. I was sure by now that this was all nothing but a stupid troll. I was about to just close the page when I read the text below the picture. Enter the name. Next to it was a text field in which I could enter text. Yeah, right, I thought at first. After a while, though, my curiosity took over. I'd spent more than a week trying to solve this thing, and even if it was bullshit, I wanted to get to the end. What name, though? What was I supposed to enter? I looked at the image of my room again. There was my bookshelf, my bed, and the pictures on the wall. Was he talking about one of the books? I haphazardly entered the names of various authors, but none of them worked. I leaned in closer and looked at the picture intently. After a couple of minutes, I felt strangely watched and jerked around, but I was obviously alone. I rubbed my temples and told myself it was all a stupid joke. For the next half hour, I tried everything I could think of. Hell, I tried my own name, but nothing worked. It was at this point that I noticed something. It was a picture of my girlfriend and I sitting on my bookshelf. When I entered her name, the page started to load, indicating that I'd solved the riddle. I was waiting for yet another cryptic message, but I was greeted with a page that said, Winner, at the top. I frowned, waiting for a troll face or a rickroll to appear on the screen, or hell, maybe a picture of me sitting in front of my computer looking like an idiot. Instead, a short sentence appeared in the middle of the screen. The greatest reward of all is the truth. As I read the message, a list of eight links appeared on the screen below. Secret 1 was the first going on until Secret 8. What the hell? Don't tell me this was some shitty conspiracy theory or esoteric bullshit. I was prepared for almost anything. To find out that Trump was a lizard person, that Obama was an alien, or to see some sort of sick graphical images. I took a deep breath and clicked the first link. What opened up was a recording of Facebook. I stared at it in confusion, but then realized it was my girlfriend's profile. How the hell was there a recording of her account? Whoever was recording this clicked around for a bit before the messenger was opened. 
One was a conversation with a guy from our group of friends. The cursor moved down and started to highlight messages one after another. How are you doing today, sexy girl? Kinky, what about you? Won't Robert be mad if you send something like this to me? Haha, <laughs> no way, he's got no clue about us. As I continued reading, my heart dropped. What the hell was this? Was this... real? Did this mean that Claudia was cheating on me? What the fuck? What the fuck was going on here? I clicked back. This had to be some sort of stupid troll who was trying to trick me. I clicked on the next one and found a different recording. This one was of an email account. At first I thought it was mine, but when I scanned the screen I could see that it was my mom's Gmail account. Why the hell would someone hack her email? Then I saw the cursor move around once more. One after another, it opened up various emails about cancer treatments and medications. I felt very cold all of a sudden. A thought appeared in my mind, but I quickly pushed it away. Mom had been sick for a while, but she'd said it was nothing but a long-lasting cold, hadn't she? I went through the other links. As the title said, they all revealed the secrets of people I knew. One showed that my best friend had done terrible things to a girl, but got away due to the influence of his parents. Another proved that my uncle had been cheating on his wife for years now. I don't know anymore why I kept going, but I clicked through all of them. Afterward, I felt empty, cold, and most of all, crushed. Again, I read the message that truth was the greatest reward of all. I cursed at the screen and this whole damn thing. Why the fuck would anyone do this? Why would someone send me all this information? Was it just to fuck with me? Why? It was right at this time that Discord notified me that I'd gotten a direct message. I clicked and saw it was from Mike. Congratulations on making it to the end. It took you a bit longer than I expected, but it was fun while it lasted, wasn't it? Thanks for playing, and I hope you enjoyed your reward. I was in pure and utter rage, insulting him and asking him how the hell he found out who I was. All I got was another condescending message. Now riddle me this. Why do you think I forced you to send me an email and log into your Facebook account? It was too damn easy to get your private data. I didn't type my next message. No, I almost beat it into the keyboard. I asked him what he got from this and why he was doing all this. His answer was as simple as can be. It was only one line that he sent before he blocked me. You know, some men just want to watch the world burn. Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zawal, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zaren Ray, Angela Donovan, Larian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Bert Turner, Bajani Aspinall, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batisse, Lisa and the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabio Lavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Rezon Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Gemstar, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Being, KC Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves Annoy Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brook, The White Stag, Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm, Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders, The Archivist, Rob Smith, Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, Dmaster 311, Britt the Alchemist, Taylor the Fox, Holly Howarth, Julia McWilliam, Lily Pat, Serena and Jesse, Diego Rodriguez, Ocio Perez, Wolfcat128, 
Kamisha Coffin, Jen Scott, Avanza, Lucian Horan Allen, Hunter Nystrom, Tyson Harris, Ricky Monroe, Jess Gaming, Mastiff Nomad, James Lowe, Alabama Nana, Jessica Hunt, Kelly Savory, Chris Zamora, Dave, E.L., Michelle Angel Wolf, and Linda Allison. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you get access to bonus videos and content, as well as a Discord channel. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. It really does help a lot. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.